Introduction to the Diary of a Dead Officer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Diary of a Dead Officer by Arthur Graham West. Introduction. Arthur Graham West was born in September 1891. The first few years of his life were spent in the country, but before he was ten years old his people moved to London, where they settled in Highgate, Graham being sent to the Highgate School. At the age of fourteen he went to Blundell's School at Tiverton with a scholarship. His school days were not particularly happy. He was at that time too shy and retiring to impose himself in any marked degree on his contemporaries, and his complete ineptitude at any kind of game, I have never seen a man so demonstrably and obviously unathletic, meant that at best he would figure very much in the background in a community where skill at games was the only passport to popularity and the only measure of worth. But worse than this, West was clever. At least he was concerned with books. He was also a naturalist and concerned with bugs. His study used to crawl with caterpillars, and at that time smelt badly. These two tastes combined to damn him as a public schoolboy. Blundell's had one universal designation for anyone who regarded books as something other than work and work as something other than an unpleasant method of wasting boring tracts of time compulsorily inserted in an otherwise interesting existence. This designation was Worm. West was a worm, and there was no more to be said. Being a worm at Blundell's meant that no one thought of asking your opinion on any matter of importance and no one went out with you except other worms. As regards his taste for caterpillars, this was unusual, even a little unorthodox, and therefore an object always of suspicion, and sometimes of active suppression. At school, then, West was a quiet, effaced sort of individual, alternately bullied by big boys when they wanted to evince their superiority to worms, and cajoled when they wanted their exercises done, but on the whole too obscure to be actively disliked. In July 1910, somewhat to the general surprise, West obtained the school scholarship to Balliol College, and went up to Oxford for the first time in the autumn of the same year. At Oxford his personality expanded and developed in a remarkable way. Never in the strict sense of the word a clever man. Even by the academic standard, he took only a third in mods and a second in greats, and worked hard for them too. He became an extraordinarily well-educated one. His passion for literature was intense. He was one of those rare individuals who actually liked reading the really great men. It is always something of a shock to find a man reading Milton and Spencer, Homer and Lucretius, Shakespeare and Chaucer, for fun. But West read them all, and liked them. It was all of a piece with his discriminating literary judgment that he disliked Virgil intensely. His reading, especially in poetry, was wide, and it was always somehow hitched on to his life. It was not so much that he continually bored you by quoting, as that his comments on people and things always might have been quotations, and weren't. He caught at once the style and spirit of the writer he reverenced at the moment, and in his conversation could not help unconsciously reflecting it. I never met a man who could talk Meredith conversation so well as he could. With all this came an indescribable charm of manner. When people were attracted to West, and as time went on they became more and more attracted, they would have found it difficult to say what it was they liked in him. He had no outstanding qualities to win you. 
He was not preeminently witty, generous, genial, or hospitable. He knew few anecdotes and never told them. Perhaps it was more than anything else by all the things that he was not that he charmed. He was so devoid of push and advertisement, so quiet, tranquil, and unassuming, so eminently companionable, and above all, such a good listener, that though these things did not constitute his charm, they went some way to explain it. He had a great love for beauty in whatever form it came to him. Before he left Oxford, he became a really good judge of most things that attract the eye. He knew much of pictures, furniture, china, and would in time have become a connoisseur. His early predilection for caterpillars developed into a great liking for the country, for spring, for autumn, and the changing seasons. Summer, however, always seemed to him dull. I have spoken of him as conspicuously unathletic. He was, but he was a great walker. He prided himself towards the end of his Oxford time on his autarkia, his self-sufficiency, which never became self-complacency, and on his lack of dependence upon others. He would go off for prodigious walks by himself lasting the whole day through, or paddle in a lonely canoe far up the unfrequented upper river. He was, at least until the war came, one of those few people who really liked being alone, not so much because other people bored him as because he did not bore himself. He was, in fact, sufficiently valuable to be able to stand his own company. But he had none of the more endearing vices. He could never master a pipe. He never got drunk. I am speaking of before the war. Beer was a closed book to him, and so were cards. Also, he had never heard any music. He was just coming to music when the war took him. When the war broke out, it left him for some little time untouched. He had got so detached from the world, he scarcely ever read a paper, that it took some time for the war to shake him back into it. He went back to Oxford for the autumn of 1914, his fifth year, with the intention of reading English literature. He found that all his friends had gone, and that his boasted autarkia had forsaken him. Oxford was buzzing like a great hive with war preparations, and his poem, The Owl Abashed, shows how even at Oxford the spell began to weave itself around him. In the Christmas vacation the infection took him. He applied for a commission in a rush of enthusiasm, was turned down for his eyes, and enlisted as a private in the public schools battalion. From that time until his death in April 1917, his life was a succession of training in England and trenches in France, with short intervals of leave. In November 1915 he crossed to France, thence to the front. In four months he was home again and on his way to Scotland, where he was trained for an officer until August 1916, when he had a few weeks' leave preparatory to going to the front. Most of this leave was spent at Box Hill in Surrey, and it was there that the complete change of attitude to the war described in Part Three of the diary took place. In September 1916 he went to France with a commission, and was out there continuously until his death. It is difficult to describe with any exactness the effect of the army on a man like West, nor is it very necessary to do so, for the extracts speak for themselves. A few things, however, must be said. West joined the army from a feeling of duty, and, in the best sense of the word, of patriotism. Violence of any kind was abhorrent to his nature. He was one of that numerous body of schoolboys who had never had a fight, and he hardly ever quarrelled. In the words of an old lady who knew him well, Mr. West wouldn't hurt a fly. 
West enlisted then, convinced of the rightness of his cause, feeling it his duty to help his country, but disliking as intensely as any man that ever put on khaki the work he had set out to do. This feeling of hatred for violence rarely comes out in the diary. It was always there, but somehow it was taken so much for granted even by himself that it rarely finds expression, save perhaps in the general longing for peace that comes to every soldier. The intense abhorrence of army life which inspires almost every line of part two of the diary sprang from a different cause. West was a man of marked individuality and keen susceptibilities. He had a highly trained mind, and more than that he had a habit of independent thinking. He was an individualist who hated routine and system as devices for suppressing men's differences and reducing them to a common standard of thought and behaviour, and distrusted discipline as an instrument for forcing men to do things they disliked. To such a man the army came to seem a thing of evil. It could not reduce him in thought to the dead level of orthodox opinion which alone was recognised and encouraged, and his power of mental detachment and independent thinking, driven underground, turned to gall and bitterness, and found an outlet in the contemptuous and scathing picture of army life presented in Part Two. His leave came in the summer of 1916. The unuttered feelings of dislike and revolt that had been accumulating during the last few months had prepared the way for a change in his intellectual convictions. In part three will be found an account of that change. West became, in brief, a pacifist. A pacifist who was precluded by his position in the army from voicing or acting upon his opinions, save, as he thought, on the certainty of being summarily shot. None of those who saw him that summer, happy in his few weeks' leave and the complete intellectual freedom at Box Hill, suspected the emotional crisis through which he was passing. The bottom was being knocked out of all his beliefs. Religion and patriotism, in the ordinary senses of these words, went by the board, and God became for him a malignant practical joker, or at best an indifferent spectator of the woes of the world. During this time he wrote most of the quasi-philosophical poems that appear in Part V. Having scrapped the universe in theory, West had to face the problem of his own line of action. As will be seen, his courage failed him, and he went back to the army, believing he did wrong believing it his duty to stand out, hating and despising himself for proving false to his beliefs. From that time until his death, through all the life of the trenches, through all the scenes of marching and fighting described in Part Four, the war was always, in a sense, irrelevant to him, something that passed over him not without leaving its traces, not without mattering, but mattering always as a gloomy and sordid background, never occupying the forefront of his mind or interest, never rousing him to enthusiasm, never for a moment appearing to him as anything but sheer cruelty and waste. Even his death was irrelevant. He died, it seems, in no blaze of glory. He died leading no forlorn hope, but struck by a chance sniper's bullet as he was leaving his trench. The value of the diary lies in its absolute frankness, its stark realism, its obvious truth and sincerity. As far as possible it is given just as he wrote it, only names and a few details that were too painful or too private for publication being left out. If its detailed realism serves to correct in some measure the highly coloured picture of the soldier's life and thoughts to which the popular press has accustomed us, it will not have been written in vain. C.J. 
End of Introduction Section 1 of The Diary of a Dead Officer by Arthur Graham West This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. Diary On joining the army as a private, January 1915 The last time in England The first time in France A fine day The first time in the trenches Thoughts about death a letter from the front. West enlisted as a private early in 1915. The following extracts describe the impression produced upon him by his early acquaintance with army life. It is to be regretted that the diary which he kept about this time is very scanty, and there is no record available of the general frame of mind in which he enlisted, and of his early and more pleasant experiences of the army. In explanation of this, there is an entry towards the close of 1915 in which he says, quote, The earlier events of 1915 have to be put down here from memory in the briefest way, because I bought no diary, money being rare at the time. Lacking the stimulus to energy given by an allotted space to be filled daily, I never wrote. A perpetual undercurrent of search for a commission was the main thing though on the surface life seemed much as usual. End quote. There is no doubt, however, that West was very keen to join. His enthusiasm is shown by the persistence with which he pursued the commission which was refused him owing to defective eyesight, and the evident satisfaction with which he records getting passed by a private doctor, quote, more or less by ruse, end quote when the regular recruiting doctor had ploughed him. For a time he was happy enough, finding congenial companions, and buoyed up by the consciousness of having done the right thing, and it is a little unfortunate that the first important extract, dated March 22nd, contains some rather snobbish strictures on his companions, and conveys a general impression of discontent which was not typical of his attitude at the time. In November of the same year, he crossed to France. On joining the army as a private, January 1915 Monday, March 22nd, 1915 The first and chief way in which these experiences offended me was by their irredeemable ugliness. This was horribly intensified after some month and a half, towards the end of which I was often happy, by five of the Fayex Romuli coming into the hut and crowding the number up to over thirty. On Sunday, too, the day before this Monday, began an indefinite period of isolation for measles, and we were thrown together more. Marches in which these five were anywhere within one's range of vision or smell, not perhaps that they impinged so unpleasantly on that sense by the uncleanliness of their persons as by the rankness of their cigarettes, stirred in me such a spirit of fermenting malignity that I would cheerfully have killed them. I never hated army life so much. Their thick necks, whose lines were so graceless that seen from behind there was a continuous unbroken sweep from base of neck to crown, their big flapping ears, the inveterate curl under the hats, their insolent leering expression, or their vaguely wretched stupidity was stirringly noisome after the faces I was growing accustomed to as my own surroundings. I used to walk along, or I did this day, beside H and C, who had left their positions to come by me, while the air, soft as milk and as sweet, came past tainted by their vile cigarettes. The landscape that seemed almost to complain that such as we three were could not visit and praise it as it deserved, being further dishonoured by these ugly presences, the companions of our constraint. 
if any more of these creatures come in and no change of huts can be made they will rise like h g wells morlocks in the time machine from their position of excluded ugliness and possess the house the attitude of the former hut dwellers is universally hostile at present and some of those whose own social position was perhaps not before very well assured are foremost in the underhand campaign of indignant protest the last time in england the charing cross road monday november seventh nineteen fifteen as i began the journey through the raw november night returning to camp from this my last weekend leave it pleased me to picture all those other saturdays and sundays from early spring until the late autumn that i had spent when my station had been at w c or s it chanced that as i lifted the blind for a last sight of london the towers of westminster sprang in clear outline from the indistinguishable mass of mean buildings between them and the railway and so moulded my yet vague memories definitely to the journey from victoria to north london i remembered in an orderly detached way as if it were another's experience i was contemplating the thrill of first contact with london as i emerged from victoria station into the open square looking for a northbound bus true i never felt free never dreamt for a moment that the old days were back again myself and the city were too deeply stained with war but i gained here a comforting security that the possibilities of my old life were being preserved held in trust against the day when i should be able to resume them the shops the advertisements the people hurrying about the streets were evidence of the vitality of the former way of things and it was thus that the women pleased me especially by their brave show of other concerns than the war how delightful it was to mark the spreading of a new fashion and how kindly one felt to this one or that who with the new full skirt swinging high above her ankles gave assurance of a bold prodigality an open loyalty to a code which many affected in these days to despise but when the noisy patriotism of trafalgar square was left behind in the cool indifference of charing cross road i had usually i smiled as i thought of it left the bus and progressed in the fashion of a grazing heifer up that strangely attractive street which had always seemed to me to contain symbolically in itself all the experiences of human life the books alone from homer virgil and the oriental classics to the slim volume of modern verse a few slight poems in lame metre and uncertain of expression gave the suggestion of a vast literary republic stretching from the beginnings of time until to-day while the variety of sublime or trivial christian or pagan homely or exotic products of fine reason or depraved sensibility were reduced here to a level of silent impotence a dependence only on their appeal to something in the soul of some unknown buyer for their release from the dingy shelves the first time in france friday november twenty sixth nineteen fifteen we were all off parade in the morning and went into a small shed in the orchard full of sacks of potatoes and with the windows browned by smoke i read the saturday westminster gazette others read or wrote it was very jolly we talked of the various ways of facing these experiences whether to glorify present experience in the words of c or to dream utopias of one's own as a did a as c read an epitaph on a governess out of the s w g remarked he wished he were a governess 
and we built up a picture of a home in West Kensington, nice children, a nursery, toasting at the fire, a young, good-looking master. No parade in the afternoon. Read the Odyssey, and enjoyed it for itself, and for the really novel exercise of making out the meaning of the lines and the new interest it gave to war. A Fine Day Tuesday, November 30th, 1915 A very fine, clear, sunny day. We threw mangolds about all the morning as if they were bombs, and in the afternoon went a short march towards St. V. The sunlight lay on the wet cobbles of the road as we came back, outlining all the horses and carts with watery gold. The bare trees against the almost colourless sky were exquisitely beautiful, and filled me with an indefinable desire for something beyond that, I remember, Mark Rutherford speaks of. It was not connected explicitly with the war or the chance of death. I have always felt it looking at such scenes, and then, with the possibility of speedy death before me, I understood more clearly than ever before that I had got from this particular impression all that could be got, that it was perfect, and could not by longer living be at all improved or developed. One's wonder at all these things, the forms of trees, and the stars as I see them now at evening, is simply an elemental fact, permanently renewed, and always mixed with that painful yearning that I felt then. It is a mistake to look for any enlightenment, or to expect a time when one will somehow understand it. It is not intellectual. The First Time in the Trenches Wednesday, December 7th, 1915 Trenches a day like yesterday, but wetter. Paraded at 3.30 in haversacks and water bottle, ground sheet and leather jerkin for the trenches. Marched along a pretty bad road till dark, past an English cemetery full of little wooden crosses, until we came to a very ruined village. It was raining hard by now, and we were wet already. We struck off across the open over old trenches for almost a mile, we were meant to go by communication trenches, but they were so full of water that we had to go on top. The mud and water were worse than anything we had ever met. Many went in up to their necks, and all of us were soaked up to and over the knees. We passed the supports and reserve trenches with fires in braziers and many dugouts draped with ground sheets. In the support trench men were sleeping here and there outside, sitting on the firing platform in ground sheets. The trenches were wet but boarded at the bottom, so one did not walk in more than three or four inches of water. Our platoon was to go to the front-line trenches, which were not trenches at all, but broken bits of trench, the tolerably whole parts of which we held in sections of five. We five were together in post number G at the extreme left end of that line. It was a very bad place. About ten or fifteen yards of sandbags were standing, but the tops had been knocked off and the things were low. There was no back to the trench at all, and the water was deep. We had nothing to keep it off us but a few sticks laid across. We had no shelter from the rear or side at all. The general idea was that we were the front line and had to hold it until the supports came up. As there was a wire entanglement between us and the supports, they would take a long time to come up, and we ourselves should be wiped out. Then the supports would be caught in the communication trench like rats in a trap and killed off too. Then the reserves would come into play, repulse the enemy and shell them out. The Germans were rather less than two hundred yards off, too far to throw bombs, but snipers were active. 
though no rifle bullets ever came near us the germans had machine guns trained along the top of the parapet and they troubled us a good deal at first we were quite amused and laughed at our position but soon the damp and cold and the prospect of twenty-four hours endurance of it our isolation and exposure cooled us down and we sat still and dripped and shivered flares went up continually and occasional machine-gun bullets whizzed over us and snipers shot at twelve thirty we were relieved by some of the x regiment and sent to post number five we had got more or less dry while at the other post and now got wet again but the change was worth it across the whole bit of trench we now had a shelter of corrugated iron which covered about six feet of space bombs and ammunition were stored in a kind of recess here and it was therefore dry though water lay underfoot in the trench it had stopped raining we now sat down on boxes of ammunition and i took my boots and socks and putties off though my legs from the knees down remained like marble all the time g passed during the night asking for reports there were none from us we slept little and put no guard waking from short dozes with one's head leant back on the sandbags of the side of the trench one saw a few stars or the rising and falling light of a flare, and heard if a rifle or machine-gun fired. Thoughts about death, undated. Death one regarded in many different ways, partly according as one's beliefs or convictions concerning an after-state were bright or gloomy, partly according as one's love of life was intense or weak. I have no real firmly settled beliefs as to what will happen after death, though sometimes I think of a lease of more vigorous energy on lines higher than the highest I have known here, though not very different in kind. I remember feeling this just before we left England, and it was then, of course, that death seemed least grim. Another and more common form of death as a welcome thing was when we were in the trenches and it was very cold and wet and dull. Then I was glad to put my head up above the parapet, thinking that a bullet there was a possibility and no unwelcome one either. Such feelings prompted action that might seem to be, but wasn't, courageous. Any ideas about personal meetings after death I never had. By far the commonest mood then was that I have mentioned, where death was a relief, most welcome in itself and of no positive significance at all. A slightly different emotional state was the purely fantastic, on the whole rather a happy state, and not necessarily associated with unpleasant circumstances. I could live quite happily and vigorously in it. It was the usual reply one gave to the question, Of what use has all my elaborate intellectual training and my sensitizing myself to exquisite impressions been, if I am to be killed or crippled in a month or two? To myself in this mood, I pointed out the value of my former life quite apart from its effects insisted on the imperishability of those years, imperishable even if nothing succeeded them, just as much as if a well-filled half-century should come after them. And, turning the thought round a little, I could say, What does it all matter, after all? It was good, and would always have been good. You could not have improved those years now, had you lived, what, moreover, does one life like yours matter? Your good life before this was under the hand of some almighty power whose actions didn't refer themselves to you, and so will it be with your death now or your survival. Occasionally, again, I thought of it from the point of view of a full and happy youth 
suddenly closed before time could spoil it. The fear that a useless and ugly middle age might succeed my youth made me glad of death. I saw, though, even then, that this state of mind was more suitable to epitaphs on children's tombstones than to the reflections of a young man out a soldiering and I never really thought that I would find myself unequal to the test of maturer life, or that I should end in failure or monotony. The very blackest moments that I did sometimes go through as at B, I have noted above, and they came again now and then, moments when all existence seemed futile, and even life in peace time appeared vacant and stalely useless when all books seem to have been written, all pictures painted, all experience and sensation opened up for no good reason at all, when the whole world was a silly, blind drift, purposeless and unintelligible in itself, and populated by people whom one did not know whether to pity more for their brief mortality or to hate for their folly. There was nothing here, though, that I had not felt at Oxford or Highgate before war was thought of. It was a restless state when one's soul was masterless and not common with me. But a desire to be alive was one that came oftener and in a far more imperious form than any acquiescence in the prospect of death ever did. Mostly, it must be admitted, it was for material joys that continuance of life seemed necessary, for the joys that would be open to me again after we were disbanded. This love of the forms of worldly things was what gave death its main ugliness, the conviction that never again, once dead, should I touch and see the shapes of material things that I had loved so keenly. A recital like Rupert Brooke's The Great Lover had become increasingly possible to me as my sensibilities had widened and grown more acute, and with this, of course, went a greater reluctance than ever to leave all these things behind me, whatever abstract beauties I might win in exchange. That I should lose my books and my pictures and no more enjoy the activities they called up seemed less painful, for they did not savour so intensely of earth, except some of them now and then, as did the quite material pleasures. And, moreover, it seemed that if any life were hereafter permitted, it would be of a purely rational or abstract kind, more akin, that is, to literary and artistic pleasures. In short, it was the animal that hated death and clung passionately to promise of life. The soul and the mind, save when more definitely animal, did not much repine. There were instants when all the pride of my flesh and the lust of my eye rose up in all their manifestations from highest to lowest and willed majestically to live. Like Plato's many-headed monster, they were intensely vigorous, felt themselves supremely capable of action, and sought only the opportunity. A letter from the front, an estaminet, Saturday, February 12th, 1916. Dear lad, I had your letter this afternoon and set myself to answer it at once, we have had rather a bloody, literally, time of it. The tab I had met earlier at Woldingham was shot in the head and killed instantly one night, standing next to me, and you may have observed that we lost several officers. We had an extraordinarily heavy bombardment. Also, I had rather an exciting time myself with two other men on a patrol in the no-man's land between the lines. A dangerous business and most repulsive on account of the smells and appearance of the heaps of dead men that lie unburied there as they fell on some attack or other, 
about four months ago. I found myself much as I had expected in the face of these happenings, more interested than afraid, but more careful for my own life than anxious to approve any new martial ardour. I become, I assure you, more and more cautious, though more accustomed and easy in face of the Hun. For the moment, thank God, we are back resting, and the certain knowledge that I shan't be killed anyhow for a day or two is most invigorating. The spring is manifest here in young corn and the very air and strong winds. And even here I react to it, and find myself chanting verses of love in the valley, as I did last year in Surrey. I have an odd feeling, though very insistent and uplifting to me, a feeling which I probably vainly unfold to you, of being so integrally a part of, and so thoroughly approved and intimately associated with all these evidences of spring, that nature herself will not suffer me to be killed, but will preserve unharmed a lover so loyal and keen-sighted as myself. We shall see. I got a Spencer from tea, and am now travelling through the Fairy Queen with the chaste Brittermart. Yes, by all means send me, Tom Jones. Those long things I can manage very well here, when we are back from the hellish trenches, where I find it hard to read, though I can manage to write letters, more or less. I believe I shall get leave, if I am not killed or wounded first, certainly in two months' time, and possibly before. It is bruited about that the battalion starts leave in a day or two. My God! What heaven it will be while it lasts, and what awful hell going back! However, I live so utterly in the moment that I can easily shelve the last few hours till they come. I hope it arrives when the spring is farther on. I will bear witness to all I can to keep you out of the army. I am so intensely pleased that you've not got forced in yet, and I hope you will still escape. How bloody people seem to be in England about peace and peace meetings! I suppose they are getting rather Prussian in the country. But are all peace meetings always broken up by soldiers, who've probably never been here at all? I have contracted hatred and enmity for nobody out here, save soldiers generally, and a few NCOs in particular. For the Hun, I feel nothing but a spirit of amiable fraternity, that the poor man has to sit just like us, and do all the horrible and useless things that we do, when he might be at home with his wife or his books, as he preferred. Well, well, who is going to have the sense to begin talking of peace? We're stuck here until our respective governments have the sense to do it. Send me Tom Jones, then, if you please. I must really stop, dear lad. A. G. W. End of section 1、section、two、of the Diary of a Dead Officer by Arthur Graham West. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two, Diary. Drill, leave, more drill, lecture on discipline, discipline, hospital, the others, depression. Army instructors, sweating the waiters, a lecture on maps, meals, the company sergeant major, the book of sin, more sin, parade, ethical creed, the Glasgow Art Gallery, the North Sea Affair, a special lecture, the case of N, carrying coal, going sick, orders, some remarks about hospitals. Towards the end of March 1916, West came home and was sent to train in Scotland with a view to taking a commission. Part two describes his experiences during training. Drill, 
Wednesday, April 19th, 1916 Drill. When we first came, we had done a hundred and forty to the minute step, but this slacked off. Until today, the instructors were called before the adjutant and told to insist on it. We marched up and down at this rate, saluting most of the early morning. Before Brecker, the company sergeant major made another speech. That we had better work with him, it would be better for us to help him, and then he could help us. This hundred and forty was to be kept to, BEF men as well. He knew we had been out there where conditions were entirely different, but we must now pull ourselves together. As regards saluting with the rifle, there had been some dispute about it. He had told us to make no noise on it, but Captain R. had decided a noise was to be made, though where he had been for the last eighteen months the custom had been different. He saw a man smiling there among the BEF men, a lance corporal too. Perhaps he thought himself very knowing. Let him come and take over his job and see if he would laugh then. Let the company get the name of a smart company. The squad he himself had been taking that morning had got praised. He hadn't taken the BEF men recently, and didn't know what they were like. Let them now dismiss, saluting smartly as if an officer were on parade. At Brecker, we agreed that we would commit suicide if it went on. That C was middle-aged, being thirty-one. That happiness was never attainable. Questioned. Easter Monday, April 24th, 1916 There were to be no parades today. During the morning, however, we were routed out of the reading room to put half bricks round the front of all the huts in our line. There were ten huts. Leave. Wednesday, April 26th, 1916. We are kept in suspense about our leave. Meanwhile, all of us are saving thirty-five shillings for supposed fares to London, which we might otherwise spend, and are going very short. Parade before Brecker by six new sergeants, who were tested on us by the company sergeant major. We were kept at it an hour by these men at a great pace, with no more than two minutes easy. Rifle exercises as usual in the morning. We were granted leave at twenty minutes' notice from Wednesday till Monday morning. Many of us had not enough money to do it, never having had notice to save money for leave. We were first told that we need not go on afternoon parade, and then were put on it for one and a half hours. More drill. Wednesday, May 5th, 1916. As usual. Platoon drill under a man who didn't know the difference between column and line. A sergeant who by his own confession had never handled a short rifle was put on to instruct us in musketry. We had a lecture on behaviour, i.e. not to go into pubs. This could be done in France, where officers and men were not sharply distinguished. We were not to go about with obvious tarts, nor get drunk. We could, however, do all these things if we would get into mufti. The usual assumption that all civilians somehow fall short of gentility. In the evening we were put to scrub out huts for D Company and arrange the beds. Nothing of the sort was done for us when we came. Some of the A Company sergeants made a protest about our having too much dirty work and no time for reading. More musketry from the same sergeant, who knew neither the right orders nor drill-book method of instructions. Asked by Captain R. if he had given us a target, he said, Yes, the field in front. This fined itself down to a telegraph post that he had never really given us at all. Lecture on Discipline Friday, May 12, 1916 
a lecture by c o an englishman rather episcopalian a dull and studiously and coolly brutal man usual lines discipline consists of little things present standard of officers considered too low we should be the first products of the new methods we would be faced with a very difficult problem when commissioned being ourselves junior officers we should be expected to combat the slackness we should be sure to find there all over england the lack of discipline was spreading men were not saluting properly things were going to the dogs discipline was a habit a habit of the mind not to be picked up as territorials try to on saturday afternoons the germans though we sneered at them at the time were now proved to have perfected the system of training men in a short time we must copy the prussian method that was what we were to expect for ourselves and to enforce on our men he proceeded to draw contrasts between the undisciplined anzacs and the twenty ninth division at the dardanelles what we must aim at was as he had said the discipline of the germans they had got men to go again and again to the attack without wavering that must be our ideal usual claptrap about behaviour now we wore the white band round our hats they would watch us here in camp but not on leave or at home we must behave there as we would in camp he impressed on us the shortness of our time and the necessity for hard work on parade and in our leisure it must be said of us when we got to our battalions this is a smart officer he knows his job that is what they would try and teach us practice in sloping arms during the afternoon and cleaning out huts handles of mops to be scoured white a company beat us in no way so much as in the polish of their stove backs orders came at noon that buttons were to be cleaned before each parade discipline saturday may thirteenth nineteen sixteen early morning parade occurred with saluting with canes for an hour various new stunts introduced speech by company sergeant major to the effect that if our kits caps and huts were not clean and correct we needn't think we would go on leave because we wouldn't we would stay and clean them rifle inspection several men were had up for moving on parade among them c for scratching his chin they were brought up before captain r who asked if they had any excuse they hadn't and he told them about discipline about disciplined troops always beating undisciplined of how the new officers were all found totally unable to stand still on parade how if they had been guardsmen they would be made to stand before a clock for an hour that they had to stand still without moving an eyelash and were cursed for moving their eyes the c o inspected us in the huts with about ten people oozing after him cursed a few men for long hair or hat-band not properly white no more said afterwards c s m had us all on parade said men were not to be on c o s parade again with dirty boots that overcoat buttons were to be clean and all clean in respect of kit and equipment then he went on with a long rigmarole about men from territorial force units and some formal filling up of papers this lasted twenty minutes during which time he had us at attention or at ease the whole time never easy finally he did nothing with the b e f men at all and we need really never have been brought out there the c o to-day ordered all the spittoons to be removed from the canteen because of the look they gave to the place the canteen man had paid eighteen shillings for them 
we learnt about now that the battalion being full, the course would now start in earnest, and we might look forward to another four months. We might really have been away all the time. Hospital, Monday, May 15th, 1916 S. came back from hospital and reported cold food served after our dinner was over. Also, when he was admitted to hospital, he had to lie on the floor for the morning and afternoon, though many beds were vacant, because it was not known whether he had officially been admitted or not. We laid turf all the early morning parade. The Others Saturday, May 20th, 1916 Depression is merely a passing mood with the most of men, and comes rarely even so. The men with me felt indignant when told to go on a parade they didn't like, and for a moment after coming off it retained their resentment. But it soon passed off, and depression of spirits from general greyness of outlook as an enduring attitude was unknown to them. The prospect of four days' leave made them all delirious, so did weekends, or even the Wednesday half-holiday. In the evening, when work was done, the gramophone, golf, girls, a meal at a hotel, a magazine story, a piano, made them forget that they had ever had a complaint in the world, or that tomorrow would begin, as usual, with an adjutant's parade at five-thirty. C's disgust was more demonstrative than E's, and it amused them immensely. It was quite real, but they thought his humour was exercised for its own sake. They never came near to understanding E's nature. As before, nobody could make out C, thought he was writing an incredibly extended diary when he made his notes, but loved him for his oddity and wit. So they failed over E, who didn't even amuse them by being quaint or publicly witty, for he was rarely this. They are utterly commonplace people here, most of them. Noisy, too, with the conventional desires and lusts. They go to church a lot of them on Sundays, partly, I think, because they like the service out of religious sentimentality, partly out of custom, partly to feel themselves a part of normal civilization again, partly to get off with a choir girl. Depression, Friday, May 12th, 1916 A fearful sense of the grimness of things came over me last night which it would have been hard to express in words even then, and of which it is hard now to recapture even the details. I had a fearful cold that grew worse and worse, and I expected that by the morning, having done guard from eleven to one, I might be really ill. E had just come in and told me C was bad. He himself didn't look well. I knew how many of us did not feel fit here. This, combined with the stupidity of parading us for platoon drill or even physical drill in the wind and wet, we were sometimes kept an hour drilling in the pouring rain, and the ever-increasing viciousness and malice of the adjutant and CSM towards us seemed to keep an almost personal fiend of terror hovering above our heads. The war and the army had never looked so grim. The army is really the most antisocial body imaginable. It maintains itself on the selfishness and hostility of nations, and in its own ranks holds together by a bond of fear and suspicion, all antisocial feeling. Men are taught to fear their superiors, and they suspect the men. Hatred must be often present, and only fear prevents it flaming out. My feeling of impotent horror, as of a creature caught by the proprietors of some travelling circus and forced with formal brutality to go through meaningless tricks, was immensely sharpened by a charcoal drawing of C's called 
we want more men showing death with the english staff cap on and a ragged tunic standing with a jagged sickle among a pile of bleeding writhing bodies and smoking corpses a huge gaunt figure that haunted me horribly army instructors thursday may eighteenth nineteen sixteen a hot day we did fire control all the time under the adjutant brigade officer etc one noted first their utter inability to teach us anything because there were too many superannuated old martinets trying to do it at the same time secondly the lack of doctrine among them all even if they could have taught they knew nothing the way we were taught musketry was laughable the whole company was kept in close order echeloned in half companies at twenty paces and moved up and down the field first in single rank then in ordinary close formation finally halted in echelon and given fire orders by the platoon commander and sectional commanders with front rank kneeling rear rank standing the c o meanwhile stood in the background for a long time checking people in a peevish ineffectual way for minor irrelevancies it was always the same thing with us we had three men shouting at us at once when we were on parade each one eager to outshine the others in his keenness in detecting faults and the strength and accuracy of his denunciation of the offender it was always impossible to please them all and when one had you alone he was sure to scold you for methods on which the others had been fondly insistent our instructors and even our officers were not above confessing that they didn't know the drill which they were supposed to be there to teach us sweating the waiters monday may twenty second nineteen sixteen about this time men were beginning to go up and ask to be sent back to their units we were told when we came here that those who wished to return might do so but this was now refused men had to go on with the course we came off guard this morning and were put on a fatigue at once by the csm to move bedding etc from a neighbouring hut at eleven we had a lecture from a tired bored young man who leant up against the wall and read in a low weary indistinct voice straight out of field engineering too fast for us to take anything down even if we wished to not even trying to conceal the fact that none of his remarks were original he chose too paragraphs of vague generalities or technical details about numbers of picks and shovels and the amount of cubic feet a man should excavate the waiters who attend us at meals are at work every day including sundays from five thirty till eight thirty on their feet the whole time one waiter to a table of twelve men and early morning tea and biscuits brekker dinner tea often with some meat and supper they get only the usual shilling per diem one is glad to see they have struck for shorter hours and less work it was said to-day by one of the scotch corporals a man who had made a singularly inefficient orderly sergeant that the duties of orderly sergeant and orderly corporal must be explained to the ex men but needn't be explained to the scotchman as they knew all about it a lecture on maps tuesday may twenty third nineteen sixteen adjutant's morning parade was very cold we did sizing drill and dressing all the hour utterly useless c s m was standing about and saying he had seen recruits with two days training do it better than we did lecture by s on maps a sand model had been erected on a table by this person which occupied him an hour in the morning he had put tapes and flags on it to signify contours and heights and explained the features at enormous length 
Of course, we all knew them and realised it was all eyewash. He showed that he didn't know the difference between concave and convex, and bungled away for twenty minutes before a blackboard on which he had drawn an abominably bad map. Meals, undated. Communication drill in the afternoon, bawling across to one another in the old absurd way. Alteration in meals. The food both degenerates and diminishes. Meat baked to a dry cinder, and not enough of it, comes on at lunch. Pudding of any sort seems to be knocked off entirely. Cheese, jam, etc. are not provided at all as they used to be. Tea today at 4.30 consisted simply of a few cakes and tea. We shall see what supper is. The food as it is now would not be so bad were it not that we were led to expect something very different from our first weeks here. I suspect it has worked out as follows. The allowance for our food is very generous, and it must have been pretty well spent out at first. Obviously it would be better if our food should be reduced to the ordinary army minimum and the surplus should go elsewhere. A convenient way of doing this presented itself when the staff of waiters sent in a complaint that their work was too heavy and they got no leisure. We were told that on their account we were to have supper and tea knocked together at six. We all agreed to this. It does not look as if it would be done, for this modified tea and supper does not relieve the waiters at all and the C.O. told them when a deputation was sent up to him that it was all nonsense to expect leisure nowadays. They must go on working the usual hours. Thus they keep the staff in their places, manage to reduce the expense of feeding us, and gain the money for themselves under the pretense of lessening the waiter's work, and neither we nor the staff reap any profit. The C.S.M., asked us to pick up the loose stones about the lines. He said with his vulpine grin that he would ask us. He would not order out a fatigue for it. After tea, the whole company was ordered out to do the job. Supper tonight consisted of jugs of water, no hot cocoa as before, bread, butter, jam, and some tinned fish in a plate. No waiters were about at all. The Company Sergeant Major Wednesday, May 24th, 1916 CSM horribly prolix today. After adjutant's parade, we heard A Company being dismissed, and we were kept on to have orders read to us and to have a speech thrown in. That we were very slack in turning out of the uts. When he blew his whistle down the lines, he saw men standing with their heads round the door of the uts. Then, when we were called for by him, we must come at once, quick time, preferably double. Men went along now at slow time. We never saw him come up to an officer in slow time. He went at the double, and what was good enough for him was good enough for us. Several men were had up for laughing and talking during this speech, including G, for about the tenth time, as CSM only knows his name. By the new regulations, the net is drawn closer. South Beach Hotel in T is now out of bounds. The CO lives there and finds us troublesome, we think. At the same time, we have been forbidden to drink at pubs. The only other hotel in T is a temperance one, and hence we cannot have any drinks there at all. Liberty of wearing private kit, even away from camp, is taken from us. This was allowed even in the M Regiment. We went a route march this morning and got back very late. More degeneration of food, measly, tasteless apples. The Book of Sin, Thursday, May 25th, 1916
Morning parade prefaced by a dispute between C and the CSM, because the bugler had sounded all the calls very late, and the CSM first objected to our turning out without regard to the bugle, and then cursed us for not being ready. CSM sneered and kept saying, "'Be a soldier-like thing to do to show up the bugler. Very soldier-like, wouldn't it? Very soldier-like thing to do.' The morning parade itself was the most comic we have ever had, if it were not all so pitiable. We abandoned yesterday's marching on markers by platoons, which was some faint use for battalion ceremonial. CSM tried to explain, in a muddle of words that would have perplexed wisdom herself, the ways of throwing out markers. Then the adjutant came up and amended and contradicted his explanation and the CSM, who understood not a tittle of it all, stood in the rear, clutching nervously at his stick, pawing at his more salient features, and ticking us all off for absurd little faults, merely to show he was awake. We moved vaguely about on lines of markers, were dressed and redressed by left, right, and centre, first by one, then by another, and then by a third. The authorities rushed roaming and heated up and down the ranks, pushing and thrusting men about, bawling and gesticulating like three peevish little boys playing with lead soldiers, and all wanting to do something different with them. Long lists of positions and regulations for battalion ceremonial and company ceremonial drill were reeled off at us in angry, vulgar scotch by the adjutant and we were expected to comprehend all at once. The CSM was most awful today in his speeches. He had the sick up before him at eleven o'clock, and told several of them off for malingering, and then laid down the rule that all sick men were to parade before every company parade. The afternoon is black with sin. Before parade, the CSM and an officer, D, came round every platoon, examining the hair and telling men off all round. No camp barber is supplied, or if he is, is never there. Many names were taken. Then we marched off and were taken by the adjutant in ceremonial drill. This was like the morning, only worse. A roaring wind made it impossible to hear any commands, and what use it is all meant to be, God only knows. The CO hung about dubiously round the edges of the company, looking at his feet and striking attitudes with his stick, finally slouching off without a word. Then some of us fired five rounds at the minute to range. Before we went there, we were closed up for a speech in the lines by the CSM. It was admonitory, confidential, and anecdotal. Some of you men have been to the front, and you've got a bit heavy. Very heavy you've got, some of you. Well, you've been here seven or eight weeks now, and you ought to begin to shape a bit. You've had lots of warning. I had no warning when I joined the service. I recollect when I didn't turn my head and eyes, the colour sergeant, he comes up to me and taps me on the shoulder and says, Your name? And next I knew was I had four hours pack drill. Four hours I had, straight off the reel. Then, about this air cut. I remember in my squad when I was in the service, a lad came on with long hair and the officer told him off to have his hair cut. He came on the afternoon parade with his hair not cut. He was brought up and had seven days' cells. Seven days' cells, he had. I knows you, some of you. You take on sullen. You take and cut about coming on parade early. Well, I say to them men, come and fall in a company a hundred and fifty strong yourself and march it down to Hadjutant's Parade. Inspect it, and march down to Hadjutant's Parade all in a quarter of an hour. We know the men that comes out sullen. That means to get through with as little work as they can. 
that are here to have a good time in their certain limitations. He then passed on to strictures on boots, hair, buttons and equipment, that we should be had up before the CO for the next offence, and should find ourselves back with our units. If we wanted to go back, we should say so. They would send us back. They didn't want the trouble of training us. It was our own fault if we didn't all go away with commissions. We must all fall into line, speaking to us as a man to men. We all shuddered at that. He said that we ought to do this, we ought to do our best. Noticeable through this, as through all the speeches and exhortations that were ever made to us, was the insistence that we should do our best, and no hint of a fulfilment of the contract towards us. Three officers, we hear, were listening to the CSM speech and laughing at it. In the evening, C was sent for by CSM and was with him for over an hour. It turned out that CSM, who is called W, is a man I had met. At Oxford he was a clerk in the P.O., and J. and I had some correspondence and an interview with him over some social meeting. He was, in his letters and speech, just such a prolix, vain weakling as he is now, and I can recall his leering squint round the door, his curled-back lips, glistening, possibly false teeth, and his eyes so narrow and slit-like that they seemed almost deformed. In the interview with C, it came out that CSM was ground down by the officers, bullied by the sergeants. Look at my hat, he said to C. You may not believe it, but it's the only one of the sort in the mess. He hates the officers, of whom it now appears that the adjutant has never been at the front, and even our major at the beginning was only a terrier. He sees the absurdity of the training, expected, as we did, to be put at Oxford, has a wife and children very badly off, the sergeant's mess get no messing allowance and have to keep it up out of their own pay. He said it was the CO who cut down our food, having been assured by the doctor that we were eating too much and going sick because of it. The waiter's evil condition he corroborated. Many were back wounded from France and got only one pass in nine weeks. They could get no redress from the CO. On the score that we, when we became officers, would be able to lead a slack life, he urged us to become fit for commissions. On all hands, this consideration is urged on us for taking commissions. C put to him the old fact that bullying would do no good with men like us. It simply made us bored and indifferent, and we would not do even the work that we could do well. More Sin Friday, May 26th, 1916 Company drill in the morning under the CSM. It was very cold and we were kept standing still. Then the adjutant came and cursed us for bad arm drill. We had hands so cold we couldn't do it. The CSM made a speech in our lines after this parade. We must do better arm drill. We had a bad name already, and didn't want to get a badder. He also gave out that the adjutant had told him to let us know that the CO had been complaining again about our unsteadiness on parade, and would, if any man were brought up to him, send him back to his unit. N.B. It appears from C.'s last night's interview that several of us are already on the black list and will not be sent back to our unit, but to the X depot, whence we may go to any battalion. It is noteworthy that the C.O. has originated no order or sentiment other than these little trivialities. The higher commands are all reducible to this, as far as concerns the men. They all have their little fads, which become practically the whole of their individuality. One is hot on buttons, 
another on steadiness in the ranks, another on saluting, another on blankets, another on stove-tops, etc. Again a sinful afternoon. The CSM had us out half an hour before parade, then ceremonial, the adjutant yapping about here, there and everywhere, hut scrubbing, whitewashing of stones, scrubbing of bedboards and broom handles. Preparation hour from five to six made a washout in order to have us handy for the CSM's fatigues. They always knock off this hour if one has to go on fatigues, and then expect us to find time and quiet to read up and answer questions. The men made a complaint today at being marched in solemnly in fours to take a cup of tea and two buns. The officer said he would lodge the complaint. I learnt that many men with bad teeth were being detained at their work in camp, whatever their sufferings, until the doctor had gathered together a whole platoon to attend the dentist. Parade, Saturday, May 27th, 1916 This morning we had saluting drill for half an hour. It was the most pitiably comic parade I have ever seen, even here. First we were drilled in platoons. Our official way of carrying the stick was outlined, and a special drill by numbers drawn up for tucking the stick under the arm, taking it into the hand again, and cocking it up in the air. We practised in two movements. One, put the stick under left arm. Two, cut the right hand away. Then, one, seize stick on the underside. Two, bring it smartly down to the side. We were then marched up and down the road, saluting by numbers imaginary officers, thus. One, stick under arm. Two, hand away. One, two, three, four, five. Put hand up. Six, hand down. One, hand up to stick again. Two, hand and stick away. We did this for a quarter of an hour, yelling out the numbers. On all hands were other platoons rushing about in the same way. After this, when it had been impressed on us how hot the CO was on saluting and looking officers straight in the eyes, like a soldier as man to man, not gazing into distant regions, we were formed up, both companies A and B, in fours. Then about twenty men were put out in a wide circle with a diameter of about two hundred yards, and the whole two companies were marched round this circle. Each four went off separately at intervals of a few paces, saluting the twenty men on the circumference of the circle as they came to each of them. There were about seventy lots of fours going round like this, the adjutant, the CSM and A and B Company CSMs standing about in the middle of the circle like circus managers. For a quarter of an hour the procession went ceaselessly round, each four making the tour three times, and then we were closed and marched in home. Physical drill came immediately after Brecker, and violent running, jumping and abdominal exercises. The day was very hot. There were two mildly revolutionary drawings of C's in the hut for CO's inspection today, a bloated general on inspection, and a satirical cartoon of a man in the 10th Battalion in a motley dress, half man, half officer, fettered by red tape and chains, and stamped with broad arrows. The CSM formed us up for a speech this morning, as usual, and read a letter to us from the CO, not addressed to us, but concerning us. It desired that the cadets be informed that very little improvement in steadiness in the ranks had been noticed, that men talked and moved on parade, that a system of punishment was being devised to meet the case, and deprivation of all weekends would be the probable punishment. Every cadet found guilty of this offence would be personally interviewed by the CO and dealt with according to his offence. 
Then he went on to say he dared say that many of us detested the army, and had been doing so since the first day the war started. He assured us that he did the same thing, but yet would do everything he was told, and perform any duty, however disagreeable. We must all do our best and fall into line. Ethical Creed Undated I believe that I am getting more perfectly to the state of stoicism to which I aspire. I do really care less than I used to do for the fools and bullies in command of me. They certainly do not frighten me at all as they used to. I don't care a jot for the adjutant or the CO when they come and yap or make heavy speeches at me. I do not mind if I am ticked off on parade, and I don't think I should be at all shamed if I were finally turned down altogether. And they do not bore me as much as they do some people like C. I can throw off the mask of attention that I put on my mind perforce on parade as soon as I come off it. C bears it very badly. But I am approaching more nearly to E's state of mind, I think. I mean a state of nihilism rather than of stoicism. For stoicism's fundamental assumption was the positive one that only the good is good, and for that we should live. Whereas I sometimes think rather that nothing is good, or has any permanent value whatever. I noted it down some weeks ago that pessimism, by which I must practically have meant nihilism, was all very well as a pose, but paralysed action for good or effort towards happiness. But now I see the great attractiveness and mournful pleasure of the creed that nothing is. Moods of this kind have overcome me utterly some days lately, and I have understood the feelings of poets when they have written of the vanity of things and the nothingness of all earthly importances. One is apt to let such utterances go by as merely conventional, beautiful expressions of a sentiment to which people gladly accede in verse, but which they do not really credit for a moment in daily thought and action, and would think a man mad for carrying such beliefs into practical existence. Perhaps such poems are often shallow, the outcome of some personal disappointment when a man, robbed of his dearest wish, unjustly conceives that all wishes, both his own and other people's, are necessarily vain and foredoomed to see no fruition. And yet many men must have felt this in the general, impersonal sense, while life and hope remained to them and they still took keen pleasure in the play of thought and feeling. I have realised this for myself the absolute non-entity of everything that men hold precious. Even the decision of this war is nothing. What does England matter, or whether she wins or not? Any man of sense must subscribe with all his mind and soul to the cry of Ecclesiastes. When he goes to the British Museum and sees the meaningless, lost-looking thoats and Ramesses, sphinxes and mummies, he must feel that they are now nothing. When he thinks of the wars whose voice has come ever so faintly down to us from those ages, and of all the men and women of those times, he must understand that all existence from the earliest Egyptian dynasties and eons before them to the present day and on and on into the future is without meaning, of no absolute or continuous importance. Mankind is perpetually puffing itself up with strange unearthly loyalties and promised rewards. Man goes out to fight for a delusion to defend what he has tricked up as his fatherland. He imposes all sorts of restraints and tortures on himself in the name of virtue and respectability, sets a fool above him to worship, crawl on his knees to, and shed a blessing of purposefulness 
on his most frightful sufferings. There is only one thing real amidst all this decorative garbage, and that is the feeling of pain or pleasure together with thought. To bring happiness into the world is the only aim of action. Action undertaken for any other motive is wasted. We may seek the happiness of ourselves and of others. The existence of happiness and pain, with certain means of attaining them, is the fundamental reality on which I would now base any scheme of life I were to construct. It is true that I get happiness from being with my friends, from reading and writing, therefore I do it and can justify myself in doing it. It is true that I bring happiness to my parents by doing and suffering things which, while they do me no harm, please them. But all other creations that are supposed to have a claim on my time and life I spurn. I spurn the idea that I am naturally enthusiastic for the success of my hut, or platoon, or company, or battalion, that I am necessarily fonder of my own country than any other, and most of all, now, I reject the presumption that I worship a god by whose never-wronging hand I conceive all the present woe to have been brought upon the now living generation of mankind. If there is a god at all responsible for governing the earth, I hate and abominate him. I rather despise him. But I do not think there is one. We only fall into the habit of calling down curses on a god whom we believe not to exist, because the constant references to his beneficence are so maddening that anger stings us to a retort that is really illogical. The Glasgow Art Gallery, Sunday, May 28th, 1916 I went to the Glasgow Art Gallery in the warm, glowing afternoon with C and T. Many pictures had been removed for safety, such as Whistler's Carlyle. Still, we saw much that was beautiful, especially some of J. Maris, Anton Malfe, Bollers and Borsbaum. They paint chiefly in watercolour. Maris had two exquisite little pictures one of his two children, and one of a girl asleep on a sofa, full of a lively and intimate charm. Two more good pictures were Clausen's Portrait of a Girl in Black, and Hornell's Children Gathering Snowdrops. There is some very good Corot there, and Lavery and Orchardson. Coming out of the gallery, on the steps above the level of Kelvin Grove Park, looking down the broad paths, on one side of which crept a slow river whose banks were buried in thick clumps of bushy trees. I felt that I was regarding not reality, but one of the Dutch pictures of Prince or Ostade, or Canaletto's canals and wide prospects in Italian cities. There seemed a kind of film in the air which gave to the scene the semblance of a painting, already feeling the hand of time, and separating it as by a pane of glass from the beholder, rendering it remote and not a creation of the passing day. In the background were high-piled grey-white clouds, above which an indeterminate milky blue intensified into a deep azure. Spires and towers sprang up behind the large, solid blocks of building, very Dutch in character, that skirted the confines of the park. From where we stood the movement of the people up and down the paths was so little apparent that they helped rather than hindered the illusion of a picturesque unreality. Give them more colour in dress, more generous splendour of gait and gesture, and they would have satisfied Prince or Canaletto. As we came down among them, the illusion vanished, and the town took back its power. But still, 
here and there presented itself a scene so essentially paintable that it received despite its momentary mutability and decay something of the eternal rest and life of an emotion set for all time in colour or words life is at times so gorgeous so full of beauties from the deafening blare of storm-crowned sunsets to the miniature daintinesses of a butterfly's wing and mankind contributes his share in the beauty of his body and the beauty of his art and song that i could lie down and cry that it should be thrown into a world so empty and planless i ought not to modify this determination to regard existence here as vanity indeed it supplies more evidence still for the contention it is but another clue of thread put into our hand in this minotaur's labyrinth promising to lead us out to realms of order and delight whereas from this maze there is no escape for living man the north sea affair friday june third nineteen sixteen the serious defeat of the fleet in the north sea as we believe it to be has produced little effect in most men who talked loudly of national honour and prestige they rushed to buy papers this morning in haste to find out what had happened laughed scornfully at the navy's anticlimax remarked that it was on the army and kitchener's army at that on which we had to depend and then they seemed to forget all about it the news or rather its confirmation brought c to a state of very bad temper which worked itself off in swearing at the orderly and then jokes in the hut it is in face of such a calamity so stunning in its sudden impact and forming such an ironic background to the dance of mankind that i am rejoiced at my sense of nothingness and utter lack of importance a special lecture thursday june sixteenth nineteen sixteen a lecture by a cavalry major who is a physical drill expert for his arrival we had to wear our little thin vests and bags instead of our shirts and trousers we had formerly given these in but they were brought out to-day the whole battalion was paraded at twelve and the major a small man with an incredibly evil countenance and a soft hat on one side a jaunty man and with an inability to pronounce his r's gave a lecture on physical drill and bayonet fighting points physical drill to be done in the trenches it often could be done even under shell fire never let a man off punish him for all offences even the slightest his pals'll chip him and he'll pull together note total lack of comprehension of ordinary man's psychology in an army where all the ranks were criminals or seducers and the officers all bloody bullies the regiment could only be kept up like this nowadays such treatment engenders sheer hatred and makes men give the smallest they can without being caught treated like gentlemen they would give all they could story of officer whom nobody disobeyed twice some one disobeyed him once and he went to the hospital cheers this man babbled on about bayonet fighting and physical drill until twelve forty five the c o simpering by keeping a thousand men from their rest and their beer and teaching them nothing the case of n tuesday july fifth nineteen sixteen no longer allowed to smoke in lectures bitterly cold rainy and windy yet we had to stand about in small squads on the parade ground and do arm drill till seven forty five 
After Brecker we went and did platoon drill, then came in, were stood in a hut and made to do arm drill by the CSM. He insulted us all the time and cursed us, as he always was doing just now, for being unsteady, worse than men he had known with a fortnight in the militia. We did arm drill for forty minutes. I remark here the case of N. He had had an abscess in a top molar and had to go down to the dentist. From him he had to get an estimate of the cost of treating the tooth. The dentist presented an estimate of two and six for cleaning out the tooth and two and six for refilling it. This estimate N. gave in to the authorities at camp and received it back a week after the day he had first gone sick with the second two and sixpence crossed out, i.e. the army were willing to pay the first, but not the second. This afternoon we again did platoon drill in the drizzly cold wind. The CSM seems really mad. He alternates between the most vicious martinetism and the most reckless affability. As, for instance, this afternoon, when he was unnecessarily rude to men on parade, and then on the ground asked publicly for lozenges for his throat, said he was very pleased with us and we must work together. When we came out we were to make as good a show as he did, and that wouldn't be very much, he said. We were to be the officers, not him. He would never be an officer. Cries of yes, yes. He told us that he, with our help, and we with his, would finally make a good show as a company. The CO was on parade and seems a fool, cursed us and kept us standing in the rain to tell us to look into his eyes when we saluted him. We were paraded for the usual five to six hour by CSM as for a lecture, but he had made a mistake and there was none. Carrying Coal Friday, July 8, 1916 The CSM getting more unpopular. Organised boos surge up from the ranks against him on parade. They get louder and louder. Two men per hut were told off to fetch coal for officers' mess in the afternoon and missed parade. They will not let us off parade to do orderly work in the huts, but don't mind our coming off to carry coal for them. There were plenty of the staff who could have done it. Going Sick Saturday, July 9th, 1916 Went sick, headache, etc., CSM came in about seven and cursed me for still lying in bed and went up and shouted at one man who had been in bed two days quite poorly. We were told to wake up, stir up, that he had to get up when he was ill. Did we think the doctor would come and see us there? He, CSM, would go to the doctor as long as he could crawl to him. We were men now, not boys, and we must pull ourselves together. We should get up and begin to tidy up the hut. About twenty minutes after, he came in and cursed us all again. After Brecker, the sick paraded, and G was badly scolded for having us there late. Then we were told that perhaps we didn't know that days when we were sick were struck off our training and had to be completed at the end. Perhaps if we had known that, we should not have gone sick. Orders Monday, July 11th, 1916 A fine day with a cold wind. A parade of two companies before Brecker under the adjutant. He explains things noisily, clumsily, inefficiently and impatiently. A man gets too nervous to speak as soon as he comes out under his eye. Physical drill after Brecker. Several men scolded by instructor, acting under the orders of an officer, for coming out with cardigans on. They replied they had colds. They were told that didn't matter, that they knew what orders were, 
and were guilty of a crime in coming out improperly clothed. Men were to go sick if they had colds. A lot of men in A Company turned round and shouted, We aren't allowed to go sick with colds. That's orders too. The officer looked uncomfortable, blushed, and was silent. The physical drill was very unpopular. We would be kept standing sometimes for a quarter of an hour in our lines, waiting for the parade, in our short sleeves, with a cold, keen wind and sometimes a drizzling rain falling. Today, some of the men who had been sick yesterday, sixteen of B Company went sick that day, were still sick and reported so. The doctor complained of the number of malingerers in the battalion, and said the army method was to suppose a man was shamming until you found he was sick. Compare with this the explanation our doctor of the 16th Blankshire gave to C, who was turned down for a commission on account of a bad heart, and who asked for a discharge. You can't apply for a discharge. You will be kept as a private. You see, we have to be so much more particular about examining officers, because an officer, when he is sick, costs so much more. A Tommy, when sick, is either laughed or bullied down, or if it is too evident that he really is ill, a cheap way is found of dealing with him. We went for a route march this morning and sang songs. Among others, What Shall We Do With The Sergeant Major? On our return, before parading for a lecture, the CSM spoke at length on our unsatisfactoriness as a company, our unsteadiness, our uncleanliness, unsmartness, unsoldierlike qualities. We seemed to think we were in for a soft job. We weren't. We were to be treated just as soldiers, and ought to set ourselves a higher standard. Unfortunately, we set ourselves a lower. He had known men with three weeks' training in the militia, men with a fortnight's training. Yes, he'd known men with a fortnight's training stand more steady than we men did, some of us with more than a year. We must get rid of the habits we had acquired in the field and try to be soldiers again. And finally... This was mentioned rather more nervously at the end. That some men in the front four ranks had been singing personal songs, where names of NCOs were mentioned, that he had spoken to them of this, that we knew it was not allowed. We had all our military law books and hours for reading them up. Loud laughter and groans which he was bound to take more or less lightly. Between A and B Company there was a football match this afternoon, and Captain R said tentatively that it would be a good thing if those who had nothing special to do this afternoon went and watched it. Nobody found time hang heavy enough on his hands to do that. It was a half-holiday. One wonders how long Wednesdays will remain really free, how long before the mocking illusion of an afternoon's leisure being maintained we are forced to play or attend football matches. Some Remarks About Hospitals Footnote. It is understood that the above criticisms are not applicable to the majority of military hospitals or to the more modern establishments. The writer came into contact with one of the old-fashioned army hospitals. Editor We were isolated for measles. Operations in hospital were performed unnecessarily, e.g. C's varicose vein operation, which was futile. Use of enema before operations, brutal injections. Regulation quantity to be given to each man irrespective of his make or condition. Misery of patients during the operations. Lack of consideration shown to men about to undergo operations in the hearing of men already operated on near them, all bloody. Eye wash for inspections. Dying men made to sit up and 
ordered to smile. Doctor unsympathetic, looked on everyone as a shirker, or in his words, scrimshanker. Hospital hopelessly understaffed in orderlies and nurses. Brutality in treatment of patients when they were unwilling to undergo a certain cure, e.g. electric battery. Man wounded and minus an arm fought the orderlies, insisted on not being put under electricity, was knocked down and held on the bed by two men. Lack of men to attend entailed much suffering to patients confined to bed, couldn't relieve themselves without bedpan and nobody to bring it, people nearly crying with pain. Gloom of building, dirty bathroom, taps, e.g., all loose and tied on to wall with string. Exercise ground for walks, etc., was merely a scraggy bit of field with no grass, bounded on one side by a high wall and on the other by a cemetery. Passes granted to patients to send to their friends, two people per man. Case of man who came back from front on short leave and rushed straight from his train to the hospital to see his brother who was there. He was refused admission, having no pass. Meals never hot, much worse even than ordinary camp food, only servable at strictly regulated times, thus men from the trenches arriving late at night, wounded, wet and muddy, could be given no food, because the next meal was not till brekker at eight in the morning. The nurses managed to heat up some cocoa left over from the last meal, and gave them that. End of section two. Section three of the Diary of a Dead Officer by Arthur Graham West. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three Diary. Beginning of New Views. The Last Leave. Notes written on Box Hill Station, on Change, Highgate, Officers and the War, Why Go On, Coming Home to London on Leave. In August 1916, West obtained a few weeks' leave, preparatory to taking a commission. During this time, his beliefs in general, and his attitude to the war in particular, underwent a profound change. The following extracts describe these changes. They contain some of the most moving writing in the whole diary. Beginning of New Views Tuesday, August 8th, 1916 I now find myself disbelieving utterly in Christianity as a religion, or even in Christ as an actual figure. I seem to have lost in softness and become harder, more ferocious in nature, and in appearances certainly by virtue of my moustache. So violently do I react against the conventional religion that once bound me, or, if it did not bind me, at any rate loomed behind me, that I loathe and scorn all emotionalism and religious feeling. When I was at E waiting for a commission to come, I was boarded on two persons with whom and their friends I had several arguments, I in favour of science and abstract truth, and they in favour of emotion, denying advance of knowledge and running down science itself as a work of the devil. Of course, more often I was simply tolerant of all this sort of thing, e.g. among parsons and my family, but sometimes it burned up very fiercely, as when I found J was against me re-Christ, and liked to believe he existed simply because he was a jolly character. It seems to me shameful that a man with his power of mind should be regardless of truth, should hold that the question is one that doesn't matter, whereas I, of far less able mind, 
have by my nature's law to struggle on after truth with my inferior equipment. He threw cold water on the whole affair and made me, for the moment, the bitterer. Really, as I see now, the matter is not one of great importance, simply because belief in the efficacy of the figure is the important thing, and the reality of the existence does not longer concern me. The Last Leave Tuesday, August 15th, 1916 I had returned to London and X and Z after a week with J and M at Box Hill. Asked if I had seen my name as gazetted in the papers, I said no, I had seen no paper since I went down to Dorking. Cries of, Graham, seen no paper? How can you live? Most people are unable to see beyond the war at all. They cannot even realise that it is not the most important thing in the world, truth and beauty and love being more so. How, then, shall they ever understand the truth that the world is an iota of the solar system, the solar system an iota of the universe, and the whole under the mindless rule of primal force? You can see how great a change it was to me, coming away from Box Hill and the free, happy life of J and M and the baby, and A and lovely H on Sundays, to the narrow society of ordinary people, and to a world bounded by the columns of the Morning Post. I thought, when I went down to Box Hill, and I was quite bound to feel so, that I should not be really happy with them. I thought their happy carelessness would annoy me, that I would long for the company of those who had suffered as I had suffered, that the men with iron in their souls would be my only true companions from the war days onwards. I was mistaken. The view was dictated by a self-fostered gloominess, perhaps, a selfishness at finding my own fearful experiences unaccounted of. I was happy to put them by, and fell in love with all the sublime life of reason, art, and joy more than ever. I come back here tonight to find a summons to go to W in D and join up with the X regiment. As usual, the blow has quietened me. It has fallen, and now nothing can happen for a day or two. I can barely convince myself that I am going back to the army, that there is a war on at all. Strong upon me tonight, with M's laugh and J's voice far away, is the now familiar feeling of unreality, of dream existence. What midgets we all are! What brief phantoms in a dream! A dream within a dream! This truly is my life! And how gladly would I end it now! Notes written on Box Hill Station Saturday, August 19th, 1916 I have just been revisiting J and M. D. M. is there too. I go to W. on Monday. We read Wells's last trump out of Boone on a hill. If the war were to begin tomorrow and were to find me as I am now, I would not join the army and if I had the courage, I would desert now. I have been reading and thinking fundamentally important things this last few months. What right has anybody to demand of me that I should give up my chance of obtaining happiness, the only chance I have, and the only thing worth obtaining here? Because they are foolish enough, not reasonable enough to give their own up. That is no reason why I should abandon mine. I asked no one to form societies to help me exist. I certainly asked no one to start this war. To help on happiness as much as possible, 
I do not object. But I believe the best way to do it would be to incite people not to form armies or fight, or be absurdly and narrowly patriotic. This feeling must be suppressed, broadened out, not encouraged. My feelings and emotional experiences during these days were so strange and intense that I intend to register them as accurately as possible. I had been on leave from G since late in July, and had grown quite into the way of civil life again among my friends, especially after a very delightful week in J's cottage with M and the baby. Hence I was able to view the whole war, the part I had played in it and the part I was destined to play in the future, from a standpoint to which I had never been able to attain since the war began or I enlisted. The thought of returning to the army was, as I have said, so awful that the knowledge that it was perpetually hanging over my head made the days seem dreamlike, merely the prelude to the time when the dream should develop into the intense horror of a nightmare. I read a good deal of liberal literature, met some conscientious objectors, moved much among men not at all occupied in the war, and hence suffered a violent revulsion from my old imagined glories and delights of the army, such as I had had, its companionship, suffering courageously and of noble necessity undergone, to intense hatred of the war spirit and the country generally. Most particularly Bertrand Russell's Justice in Wartime impressed me, especially because his essay on the free man's worship so delighted me as the only quite true and nobly open-minded account of a possible religion. I so loathed the idea of rejoining the army that I determined to desert and hide away somewhere. This was so strong with me on Saturday, August 19th, when, rather against my family's wishes, I went down to J for the last time. Never was the desire to desert and to commit suicide so overwhelming. And had it not been that I knew I would pain many people, I would certainly have killed myself that night. I imagined myself getting a knife, putting its point carefully between two ribs, and driving it home with the intensest pleasure and no feeling for the pain. On that evening I stayed up late and read B. Russell's Justice in Wartime, and went to bed so impressed with its force that I determined to stand out openly against re-entering the army. I was full of a quiet, strong belief and almost knowledge that I should not, after all, have to face the trial of entering a new regiment as an officer, and that Waterloo would not see me at 2.10 to go to W. In the morning I was still determined. I didn't go to church when asked to do so, but re-read B. Russell, and made up my mind to announce to the family at lunchtime that I have come to a serious decision, long thought out, and now morally determined on. It will influence me more than you, and yet perhaps you ought to know of it. I am not going to rejoin the army. There is no object except the gratification of a senseless rivalry in prolonging the struggle. It is beastly and degrading. Why do we go on fighting? I will not go on. I really nearly did say it. Everybody thought me silent and depressed because I was returning to the army. It was not so. However, I said nothing. I walked down to the tram with X and Y and said nothing. And I returned, read Boon to Z, and after much thought, wrote to the adjutant of the battalion, telling him I would not rejoin the army, nor accept any form of alternative service. 
that I would rather be shot than do so, and that I left my name and address with him to act as he pleased. Shortly after midnight I went down to the post with this letter and two more, one to J, one to E, telling them what I had done. I stood opposite the pillar-box for some minutes, wondering whether I would post them, then put them in my pocket and returned home to bed. Next morning my aversion was as great and my determination not to rejoin as strong as ever. This was Monday morning, the day I had telegraphed I would rejoin. I thought I would tell the remainder of the family, Z and the maids. I didn't. I got furiously into my new uniform and went off after Brecker to cash a cheque and get my hair cut and order a cab. As the barber cut my hair, I determined I would go down and telegraph that I could not come to W, and that explanations were following. I walked to a telegraph office to do so, and bought two penny stamps and walked out again. I cashed a cheque for ten pounds, saying in excuse that it might help me if I determined to desert. Then I went to order a cab, but thought at the last moment I would walk on to a telegraph office beyond the cab office. I turned back soon after I had passed the office and ordered the cab. This settled it, I thought. I returned home, packed, wrote to J, had lunch and half communicated my state of mind to Z without letting her see how near I had come to fulfilling it. Then I read her some Bertrand Russell, and shocked her sentiments a good deal by what I said. I departed in a state of cynical wrath against myself and the world in general, who would understand so little of what I meant. At Waterloo I met E, who had been sent to Woolwich in mistake for W. Seeing him so encouraged me that I forgot my woes for a bit. As we drew near W, horror of rejoining the army was making me very miserable. Moreover, I had been reading B.R. in the train, and was encouraged to believe that, as I put it to myself, I might yet quite succeed in keeping my mind and spirit straight, even if I could not induce myself to acknowledge it among my enemies and those who would be indifferent to me. I said to E., that I had come to think so differently now that I would not rejoin the army were the war to begin, as it were, to-morrow, and that if I had the pluck I would desert now. I said I was under so many delusions when I joined at first. Most of these had faded, especially religious ones. I had seen how utterly wide of truth most of mankind, even accredited professors, etc., were in this matter, and thus was quite prepared to find them wrong about war in general, and this war in particular. I found them fully as wrong as I expected, and was only anxious to dissociate myself from them in thought, if I daren't in action. E. rather sniffed at the idea, said that we could not have done anything different at the time, and that we would do the same again under like circumstances, that having discovered new truth made or would make any difference to his actions, he denied. But I feel that I would not do the same thing again. On Change, A Free Man's Worship Thursday, August 24th, 1916 it is at least possible, owing to the wild caprice of mood and emotion, which yet do seem to advance definitely on some line or other, do not, I mean, throw down one set of values simply to rebuild it later, but build quite anew on what they ruin. It seems possible, having regard to this, that my whole outlook on life will change so utterly again that I shall barely know myself. So deep have the changes in me been recently through Christianity, theism, 
paganism, to atheism and pessimism, and so rapidly have they consummated themselves that I seemed till only a few weeks ago an entirely new being. And even now I think those changes were greater and more lasting than any I have ever undergone until now. But yet I see them now as still part of a system. They too share the general flame-like character of man's life, in that, though their blaze was high and searing, yet they pass, and the continuous fire of my existence goes on under different aspects. I have not been by them utterly consumed, still it is true panta ray, and here too will come a change, a great change, perhaps. I had regarded them as something too utterly final. I was wrong. The tendency to seek for finality, to look for some resting place in development, some road offering shelter more permanent than nightly inns, is a delusion and not to be acquiesced in. Still the change goes on, and still I travel forward. To hate or laugh cynically at religion and religious feeling in older men, poets or philosophers, is to lose sight of this truth. They are plainly men of wisdom and sensibility at least as acute as our own. They have had, too, so much more time to grow and experience. Therefore we should look carefully and interestedly at what they have to tell us of the feelings of the soul in its mid-journey and in the days when it knows the end of the road is really at hand. For as we are, they were once, and we may be what they are. But we do not do well to extend this consideration to all. Indeed, we should refuse it to most men. Only poets and philosophers may demand it from us, not fools or the mass of mankind. And yet I think, as I write, of Bertrand Russell, who, in his essay, A Free Man's Worship, sets out from the belief that I hold now to construct a noble and bold religion which is so compelling in its call and so honest in its facing of facts that it seems possible to acquiesce in it. It is very interesting trying to forecast one's own development. The open mind, the sensitive heart, these are what we must keep exposed to experience for it to print on them what it may. I never would have thought to read there what is written there now. Some months' perusal of it accustoms me to the legend, and I wonder what the next announcement will be. Highgate, noon, Monday, August 21st, 1916 Dearest lad, I go down in an hour to the pit again, less willingly, more hating it than ever. What I have thought and read lately and from being with you makes me doubt very much if I do well to go. This is the bitterest part of it. I do ill to go. I ought to fight no more. But death, I suppose, is the penalty and public opinion and possible misunderstanding. You see how complicated it gets. Thoughts were given us to conceal our passions from ourselves. Were I to follow mine, my passions, I would not be here. But now is the native hue of resolution sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought. I am almost certain I do wrong to go on, not quite certain, and anyhow, I question if I am of martyr stuff. Write soon, A.G.W. Officers and the War, Monday, September 11th, 1916 I must try and make out what the officers among whom I move think of this war. Its causes, its probable effects, 
its merits and demerits, and its remedies when it is over. One sees, of course, that all the society in which one may at any moment find oneself is very fluid, and one doesn't like to hazard opinions, and they are not easily elicited. I have mentioned the feeling against conscientious objectors, even in the minds of sentimental and religious people. Even R. speaks sneeringly of Bertrand Russell. No one is willing to revise his ideas or make clear to himself his motives in joining the war. Even if anybody feels regret for having enlisted, he does not like to admit it to himself. Why should he? Every man, woman and child is taught to regard him as a hero. If he has become convinced of wrong action, it lands him in an awkward position which he had much better not face. So everything tends to discourage him from active thinking on this important, and in the most literal sense, vital question. They are, as one knows, many of them worthy and unselfish men, not void of intelligence in trivial matters, and ready to carry through this unpleasant business to the end, with spirits as high as they can keep them, and as much attention to their men as the routine and disciplinary conscience of their colonel will permit. They are not often aggressive or offensively military. This is the dismal part of it, that these men, almost the best value in the ordinary upper class that we have, should allow themselves to suppose that all this is somehow necessary and inevitable, that they should give so much labour and time to the killing of others, though to the plain appeals of poverty and inefficiency in government, as well national as international, they are so absolutely heedless. How is it that as much blood and money cannot be poured out when it is a question of saving and helping mankind rather than of slaying them? I suppose it is the suddenness and the threat of unusually terrible destruction when war comes that makes men respond so willingly to this singularly uninspiring appeal when they will not listen to the socialist. Why go on? Sunday, September 24th, 1916 A tent I am very unhappy. I wish to make clear to myself why, and to thrash out what my desires really tend to. I am unhappier than I ever was last year, and this not only because I have been separated from my friends, or because I am simply more tired of the war. It is because my whole outlook towards the thing has altered. I endured what I did endure last year patiently, believing I was doing a right and reasonable thing. I had not thought out the position of the pacifist and the conscientious objector. I was always sympathetic to these people, but never considered whether my place ought not to have been rather among them than where I actually was. Then I came back to England, feeling rather like the noble crusader or explorer who has given up much for his friend, but who is not going to be sentimental or overbearing about it, though he regards himself as somehow different from and above those who have not endured as he has done. I have described how I modified this feeling after much company with J. It would certainly be much pleasanter if I could regard myself still in this rather sublime light as the man who goes into the pit for his friends. But I cannot do so, for I am beginning to think that I never ought to have gone into it at all. This war is trivial for all its vastness, says B. Russell. And so I feel. I am being pained, bored and maddened, and to what end? It is the uselessness of it that annoys me. I had once regarded it as inevitable. Now I don't believe it was. And had I been in full possession of my reasoning powers when the war began, 
I would never have joined the army. To have taken a stand against the whole thing, against the very conception of force, even when employed against force, would have really been my happier and truer course. The war so filled up my perspective at first that I could not see anything close because of it. Most people are still like that. To find a growing body of men who can really be au-dessus de la mêlée, who can comprehend and condemn it, who can live in the world beside the war and yet not in it, is extremely encouraging to anyone who can acclaim himself of their brotherhood. Spiritually, I am of it, but I am prevented from being among them. I am a creature caught in a net. Most men fight, if not happily, at any rate patiently, sure of the necessity and usefulness of their work. So did I, once. Now, it all looks to me so absurd and brutal that I can only force myself to continue in a kind of dream state. I hypnotize myself to undergo it. What good, what happiness can be produced by some of the scenes I have had to witness in the last few days? Even granting it was necessary to resist Germany by arms at the beginning, and this I have yet most carefully to examine, why go on? Can no peace be concluded? Is it not known to both armies that each is utterly weary and heartsick? Of course it is. Then why in God's name go on? It must be unreasonable to continue. The victorious or seemingly victorious side ought to offer peace. No peace can be worse than this bloody stupidity. The maddening thing is the sight of men of fairly good will accepting it all as necessary. This angers me, that men must go on. Why? Who wants to? Moreover, I feel quite clearly that I ought to have stood aside. It is these men who stand aside, these philosophers and the so-called conscientious objectors, who are the living force of the future. They are full of the light that must come sooner or later. They are sneered at now, but their position is firm. If all mankind were like them, there would not have been war. Duty to country and king and civilization. Nonsense! For none of these is a man to be forced to leave his humanity on one side and make a passionate, destroying beast of himself. I am a man before I am anything else, and all that is human in me revolts. I would fain stand beside these men I admire, whose cause is the highest part of human nature, calm reason and kindliness. The argument drawn from the sufferings of the men in the trenches, from the almost universal sacrifices to duty, are not valid against this. Endurance is hard, but not meritorious simply because it is endurance. We are confronted with two sets of martyrs here, those of the trenches and those of the tribunal and the civil prison, and not by any means are the former necessarily in the right. And it is not even as if the army men were content simply to do their dirty work. They sneer at the pacifists. They encourage the sentiments of the spectator and such poisonous papers, or at any rate they are profoundly indifferent to the cause of internationalism. They are ready to fight and beat the Bosch, as they will call him, and there is the end. Yes, there was but one way for me, and I have seen it only when it was too late to pursue it. Even be the thing as necessary as you like, be the constitution of this world really so foul and hellish that force must be met by force, yet I should have stood aside. 
no brutality should have led me into it. Had I stood apart, I should have stood on firm, logical ground. Where I was, truth would have been, as it is among my friends now. To defy the whole system, to refuse to be an instrument of it, this I should have done. Coming home to London on leave. Wednesday, September 6th, 1916. I have succeeded in getting leave, and right now in the back garden of M's house at Beckenham. I arrived last night about nine, very short of money, having only about three shillings to travel up from W to town, luckily with a ticket. We reached London about seven. The sun was setting as I crossed Waterloo Bridge, a red bubble behind the Houses of Parliament. But in Waterloo Station the sunlight had still been intense, though of that thick, almost palpable radiance that low sunbeams have from autumn suns seen through glass. After the journey, almost the vividest happiness is over. The ever-nearing imminence of London, the outlying commons dotted with children's figures playing. One, I remember standing up amid a bush of dark green gorse, wearing a little red, coral-like cap. You approach the wilderness of roofs, see the tall buildings so familiar to you far away over them. The train winds and twists bumpily over points and switches. You lean out of the window and look up the long vertebrate rod of carriages, watch them turn and tail round the curves. You pass Battersea and Vauxhall, more and more widths of line, shunting engines, pointsmen, forests of signals. The signal boxes perched right up above the line. The arch of the great station opens before you, dark and gloomy beneath the dirty glass. The ends of the platforms stretch forth to meet you. You wonder which it will be, this side, this side. In you glide past the long line of porters and waiting friends. You alight. Everyone is welcomed. You make your way out. London. London. I think the first piece of conscious unhappiness comes when you realise how alone you are. You have returned to London full of an immense energy and desire towards happiness. You want companionship in it. At camp, when you have been happy, you have been happy by being with friends, mainly, by taking joy from them, and by the assurance that you are returning it to them again. Here in London, you want the same kind of thing, but in different terms. In camp, the happiness for both is the intenser, because each realises that only with and from the other can he satisfy his wants. With E alone, for instance, could I be happy, and I knew it was so for him. Naturally, I turned to E, and as naturally was I satisfied. Here, to whom shall I turn? Custom demands I shall turn to my family. Affection demands no less that I shall turn to my friends, the friends who have always been good to me and with whom life is good. There is a well-experienced conflict in the first place. But over and above these two desires is a third. Perhaps I should say that the third desire is really the only one, fulfilling itself inadequately in each of the two better identified wishes. This third desire, then, I can hardly analyse it. Monday, September 11th, 1916 I continue, really, the line of thought from what I have written above. What has come to me recently is the supreme value of human love. I have never loved my friends so much nor rejoiced so deeply in the assurance of their love for me 
as I have done during the last few weeks before coming out here. It has seemed the most blessed thing in the world to have J and M, M and M, A and H, to love me, and to feel they know how I love them. The growing joy of this is coming to compensate me for all I lost when any vague notion of eternal and supernatural benevolence had to be abandoned. It is from man we must seek our greatest happiness, man the lover. It is plain from this that love gains a zest, is prized more highly when it is given to and taken from one whom we have chosen for ourselves, or who has chosen us. The relation of friendship becomes, in fact, more precious when it is open to one to accept or reject communion with another soul, and acceptance so amply justifies itself. Going a step further from this, it is evident that the pleasure of gaining affection from new sources and pouring oneself out in new affections must be one of the greatest pleasures in life, perhaps greater than the constant renewal of old loves, though this with J is priceless in value. It is this great tide of love surging up in one that prompts the feeling of loneliness when the narrow love possible in camp is widened out. This is where the third desire I spoke of enters. Love, it is felt, ought now to be given, as it were, absolutely anew. Surveying mankind, one wants to choose out some recipient for true love. End of section 3section four of the diary of a dead officer by arthur graham west this librivox recording is in the public domain part four diary in the trenches living for the moment in and out of the trenches points of view atheism utterances of a german prince in and out of the trenches again the common view after the attack, special course of training in France. In September 1916, West returned to France as an officer. The extracts in this part cover the time from his arrival in the trenches until his death in April 1917, a period during which he was continuously in France. The diary ends with a couple of extracts describing his happiest time in the army while undergoing a course of training at an officer's school. In the Trenches, Sunday, September 17th, 1916 A tedious morning in the trenches prompts me to write down experiences and trivial little events, which ordinarily I would not value enough to record, simply to pass the time. The trenches I am in are near G., were originally German and have been recently captured by the British. I have not been really in the trenches for a long time and find the renewal of the experience particularly trying. We got up here about 2.20 a.m. Sunday morning, a terribly long relief, for we started out for this line from G. Ridge at 8.30 p.m. Saturday night. The men were dog-tired when they got here, and though ordered to dig, complied very unwillingly, and were allowed to sit about or lean on their spades, or even to stand up and fall asleep against the side of the trench. It was a smelly trench. A dead German, a big man, lay on his stomach as if he were crawling over the parades down into the trench. He had lain there some days, and that corner of trench reeked even when someone took him by the legs and pulled him away out of sight, though not out of smell, into a shell-hole. We sat down and fell into a comatose state, 
so tired we were on our right lay a large man covered with a waterproof his face hidden by a sandbag whom we took to be a dead prussian guardsman but the light of dawn showed him to be an englishman by his uniform from where i sit i can see his doubled up knees the men lay about torpidly until four thirty a m when b ordered a stand to we tried to keep awake merely for form's sake while the light very slowly grew stand down went at five thirty and b made us tea and added rum for the others the very smell of rum makes me sick because it is connected with the trenches last winter one always feels better with daylight of this kind of life alone is the psalmist saying true in ordinary modern life where unhappiness consists so much in mental agitation it is startlingly false we joke over the tea and biscuits go into the next bay and talk to the men about the german things they have found and are determined to get home somehow a rifle a belt buckle with got mit uns on it a bayonet and so on we try and make out where we are on the map and find we are at least a thousand yards away then we resolved that as we had practically no sleep last night nor the night before and i had little even the night before that we will try and get some we lie wednesday september twentieth nineteen sixteen so far i had written when it became evident that our quiet sunday was to be of the usual kind and we were to be bombarded h e shells about six inch ones came over with a tremendous black smoke making an explosion and sending up a column of earth about thirty feet high the first intimation i had was when i went round the corner to the next bay to see where one had fallen and found a man with a little ferrety nose and inadequate yellow moustache in a very long greatcoat sitting muttering away on the firing step like a nervous rabbit and making vague gestures with his hands and head he would return no answer to questions and i was told two men had just been buried in a dugout nearby i went round and found two more pale men rather earthy i talked to them and did my best to comfort them a few more shells came over unpleasantly near but it was not yet certain whether they were definitely after us soon this was clear they worked down a winding trench and blew in the walls we lost six men by burying and ten others wounded or suffering from shell shock it was horrible a whistle would be heard nearer and nearer ceasing for a mere fraction of a second when the shell was falling and about to explode where was it coming men cowered and trembled it exploded and a cloud of black reek went up in the communication trench again you went down it two men were buried perhaps more you were told certainly two the trench was a mere undulation of newly turned earth underneath it somewhere lay two men or more you dug furiously no sign perhaps you were standing on a couple of men now pressing the life out of them on their faces or chests a boot a steel helmet and you dig and scratch and uncover a grey dirty face pitifully drab and ugly the eyes closed the whole thing limp and mean-looking this is the devil of it that a man is not only killed but made to look so vile and filthy in death so futile and meaningless that you hate the sight of him perhaps the man is alive and kicks feebly or frantically as you unbury him anyhow here is the first and god knows how many are not beneath him at last you get them out three dead grey muddy masses 
and one more gibbering live one. Then another shell falls, and more are buried. We tried to make them stand up. It is noticeable that only one man was wounded. Six were buried alive. I shall always remember sitting at the head of this little narrow trench, smoking a cigarette and trying to soothe the men simply by being quiet. Five or six little funk holes dug into the side of the trench served to take the body of a man in a very huddled and uncomfortable position, with no room to move, simply to cower into the little hole. There they sit like animals for market, like hens in cages, one facing one way, one another. One simply looks at his hands clasped on his knees, dully and lifelessly, shivering a little as a shell draws near. Another taps the side of his hole with his fingernails, rhythmically. Another hides himself in his greatcoat and passes into a kind of torpor. Of course, when a shell falls onto the parapet and bores down into the earth and explodes, they are covered over like so many potatoes. It is with the greatest difficulty that we can shift the men into another bit of trench and make them stand up. I found myself cool and useful enough, though after we had been shelled for about two and a half hours on end, my nerves were shaky and I could have cried for fright as each shell drew near, and longed for nothing so much as to rush down a deep cellar. I did not betray any kind of weak feeling. It was merely consideration of the simple fact that a shell, if it did hit me, would either wound me or kill me, both of which were good inasmuch as they would put a pause to this existence, that kept me up to my standard of unconcern. And the more I experience it, the more fear seems a thing quite apart from possible consequences, which may occur in a person even when he assents fully to the proposition I have noted above. I feel afraid at the moment. I write in a trench that was once German, and shells keep dropping near the dugout. There is a shivery fear that one may fall into it or blow it in. Yet what do I fear? I mind being killed, because I am fond of the other life, but I know I should not miss it in annihilation. It is not that I fear. I don't definitely feel able to say I fear the infliction of pain or wound, I cannot bind the fear down to anything definite. I think it resolves itself simply into the realization of the fact that being hit by a shell will produce a new set of circumstances so strange that one does not know how one will find oneself in them. It is the knowledge that something may happen with which one will not be able to cope or that one's old resolutions of courage, etc., will fail one in this new set of experiences. Something unknown there is. How will one act when it happens? One may be called upon to bear or perform something to which one will find oneself inadequate. The shelling went on, on this Sunday, I mean, for about five hours, and we had a few biscuits and a tot of whisky about one o'clock. By then the whole of the little communication trench had been battered by successive shells, and we had left off going down it after each one, as the Germans had turned machine-gun fire onto the levelled portion of trench. We stood, B, G, B, L and I, in the only undamaged bay, eating and drinking, and watching the huge columns of earth and smoke as the work of destruction went on. They had worked rather off this particular trench, and the men still stood all about it, but I believed for certain that they would return towards the end and smash in the only bay to which they would naturally have hoped to have driven us. 
I had had enough whisky to enable me to view this prospect with nothing but interested excitement, and really did not flinch as the shells fell, seemingly groping their way towards their mark. Just as they drew near, a runner from the Exes came down to say the Germans had broken through on their left and were attacking. Would we look after the third line and the flank? This news woke us all up from this rather unreal alertness of impending destruction, and we rushed off with rifles, bayonets, and all manner of weapons to man the trench. No foe appeared, but it cheered us, and they did not shell very much more that night. The strain of the whole thing was very much worse than anything we had ever had at the B section. Living for the moment, Tuesday, November twenty third, nineteen sixteen. A grey, warmer day. The sun looked through only for a minute or two in the afternoon. We went in the evening to an estaminet on the left. After that, C. L. and I walked down the road under the moon, and talking to him then, I grew more convinced of the brutalizing process that was going on. How impossible it was to read, even when we had leisure! How supremely one was occupied with food and drink! C. L. himself said he had found the same on his first campaign. It took him three weeks to get back to a state where he could read, and so it is. All my dreams of the days after the war centre round bright fires, armchairs, good beds, and abundant meals. In and out of the trenches, Monday, September twenty-fifth, nineteen sixteen. A better village than we have been in yet on the A River. Poplar lanes and water meadows and red sunsets, calm and chilling. Moved to the sea in a valley with a camp in it about seven miles this side of M. A comfortable night there. Tuesday, September twenty-sixth, nineteen sixteen. Moved at eight thirty towards the front. Everybody rather fed up and tired. Reached a shell-torn ridge just near G about noon, and stayed there till six p.m. Eating, drinking, and sleeping, then moved up to occupy trenches near M. A quiet enough night, but not much sleep. Wednesday, September twenty-seventh, nineteen sixteen. The French came up behind us in large numbers, very active and talkative. Daylight showed a fearful lot of dead Germans round the trench, and an appalling shambles in the dugouts. A fairly quiet day, sunny. The French moved about all over the valley, regardless of anything. We had two good meals. We were relieved at night by the French. Thursday, September twenty-eighth, nineteen sixteen. Left trenches at about four thirty a.m. Fearfully tiring march back to C, where we lived in a kind of manhole in the trench. B, B, L, and I had one to ourselves, and our valises with us. Slept and fed, read Scholar Gipsy and Thersis, and talked about Oxford together at night. These two are the only valuable men among the officers of the company. Friday, September twenty-ninth, nineteen sixteen. Rainy and depressing. Up to trenches again by T Wood. Seven men killed by a shell as soon as we got in the trench. Beastly sight. I went up to find the way at G at night. I got back to find the buzzard's cake. Jolly evening. Slept on the floor of a dugout. Stomach troubles. Points of view: Atheism. Saturday, September thirtieth, nineteen sixteen. Walked through D Wood with B. Wood in an unspeakable mess. The fields are all over dandelion and vetch here. 
the sun, of course, is in the April-May position again. Wrote to M, C and N. We moved back a few hundred yards to B Wood and slept in a rough bivouac. I was very warm and comfortable. It is notable that tonight we discussed ever so slightly the problems of atheism. I had pronounced a few days ago that I was an atheist, and after a few of the usual jabs at Balliol the thing passed off. Tonight I said something about my being a respectable atheist, to which it was promptly answered that there could be no such thing, and people said, You aren't really an atheist, are you? Thus we see how men cannot get out of their minds the horrid atheist idea, the idea that intellectual convictions of this sort must of necessity imply some fearful moral laxity. The most religious men are really the extreme Christians or mystics and the atheists. Nobody can understand this. These two classes have really occupied their minds with religion. Utterances of a German Prince Sunday, October 1st, 1916 A fine morning. Wrote to sea. We built a kind of shelter during the day and had a pleasant day altogether. Good meals, but never quite enough. Peace came near tonight in several ways, and filled us with a happy contentment as we went to bed in our shelter with plenty of candles. Warmth and a misty autumn night, fairly quiet, too, for the front. I received today a memorandum about Bertrand Russell, telling of a course of lectures he would give, and containing a statement by himself of what the War Office had recently done to him. It showed the strength of the conscientious objector and pacifist movement, even in this welter of brute force. Then I read of an article by a German, Prince H., on the necessity of at once stopping the war, making the usual and obvious points very well, it was good to find a German and a prince speaking so wisely. S., an officer here from Oxford, nonconformist and, I think, religious, came back from a machine-gun course and remarked half ashamedly that he had really come to the conclusion, since he had been away, that the war was really very silly and we all ought to go home. Nobody took any notice of what he said, or else treated it laughingly, but I saw he meant it, and really had seen something new. It had come to him as a definite vision, and he was a bit disquieted. This is as it should be, and I must get talking to him. In and out of the trenches again, Monday, October 2nd, 1916 Rain Read Tristram Shandy with much pleasure. New age came. We sang jollily in our bivouac at night, B, G and I. We slept well. S took a carrying party which didn't return till 5.30 a.m. G came back and brought a bottle of whisky with him. Tuesday, October 3rd, 1916. Rain. Went in search of a canteen with G and failed to find one. Started at 3.30 in the afternoon to go up in support. Didn't arrive at our right trench till 2.30 next morning. Misty and cold. Very tired. Wednesday, October 4th, 1916. Rain all morning. We sat and sang. Went out at night. Very fatigued. G came in with a working party at 7 a.m. on Thursday morning. We were in bivouac at T. Wood. He had great trouble with the men. The Common View Thursday, October 5th, 1916 Dull I observed several more features in the common opinions concerning the war. 
G said, Fancy all this trouble being brought on us by the Germans. Universal assent. Then B, the captain, remarked that it was really very silly to throw pieces of lead at one another, and from this someone developed the idea that our civilization was only a surface thing, and we were savages beneath the slightest scratch. What no one seems to see is that our country may be at any rate partially responsible, or that those who, like conscientious objectors, refuse to debase themselves to the level of savages are worthy of any respect, intellectually, if not morally. One observes again the it-had-to-be attitude, which Hardy notes about the d'Urberville family. So it is. People will not really move a finger to mould even their own lives outside the rules of the majority or public opinion. No one sits down to consider the rightness of his every action, and his judgments on political action he takes from the papers. Independent judgment in private or public affairs is the rarest thing in the world. We did nothing all day but rest, I read Tristram Shandy and wrote letters. SOS signals came through at night just at dinner and perturbed us somewhat. They were soon cancelled. Friday, October 6th, 1916 Fair. Arrangements made for an attack tomorrow. I was left out. I was very glad to go. Reached the transport lines about 7 p.m. and had a good dinner and sleep. Saturday, October 7th, 1916. Went off to C by lorry. Saw B walking along the road near T and had lunch with him and his ambulance. C is a delightful town, quite small but compact and efficient. I bought butter and cheese and fruit and had tea at an excellent small patisserie. A kind of large paved hall in the fashion of the Dutch pictures gave off from behind the shop, and one fed at tables round it. There were cages of canaries there that sang lustily, and a few great dogs. These sounds combined with laughter, quick talk, and the song of girls echoing in the spacious area, were the most pleasant thing that I had heard. I left C about 4.30 and got back about 7. Battalion attacked. After the attack. Sunday, October 8th, 1916. News came through on this day of heavy rain and wind of our losses in the attack. Very heavy. B, L and B, L all killed. B, a good blighty. G, dangerously wounded. I never felt more utterly sick and miserable than today. We moved up at midnight to B Wood to await the battalion's return from the trenches. They were very glorious when they came, but arrived at the sand pits near M, a very tired crowd, about one thirty p.m. Sunday, October 15th, 1916. Moved from M. It was very pleasant there in some ways. Dinner was good with O, the doctor and parson. Not bad arguments and a good deal of freedom. I, being the only man outside headquarters who has any idea of logical abstract argument, was in the more favour. The parson I like. He has wit and a pleasing frankness. The doctor is feline, almost Jewish and strokeable. Friday, November 3rd, 1916 I sit on a high bank above a road at H. By my side stands a quarter of a bottle of red wine at one and a half francs the bottle. The remaining three quarters are in my veins. I am perfectly happy physically, so much so that only my physical being asserts itself. From my toes to the very hair of my head, 
I am a close, compact unit of pleasurable sensations. Now, indeed, it is good to live. A new power, a new sensibility to physical pleasure in all my members. The whistle blows for fall in. I lift the remnant of the wine to my lips and drain the dregs. All the length of the march it lasts me, and the keenness, the compactness, the intensity of perpetual well-being doesn't even leave my remotest fingertips. The silver veil of gossamer webs surround my hair, the juice of the autumn grape gladdening all my veins. I am the child of nature. I wish always to be so. Special Course of Training in France Saturday, February 10th, 1916 The course at F, which I entered on at the beginning of January, is now over. About twenty of us in one mess at an inn in the Rue de Th were my principal companions. They were of all regiments, three or four Australians, two Scotchmen, two guardsmen, and the rest mainly North Country. Here, as usual, is the same lesson to be learnt about men in the lump. They were all very nice, and couldn't understand me. They thought I was a pro-German, a socialist, and a poet. Anyone who isn't at once intelligible is put down at any rate as the first of these. They are all full of petty, narrow loyalties to regiment or county. I think North Country people are more intensely narrow and venomous in this way. They are all rather against America, or were when Wilson was beginning his negotiations, and talk of Yanks and yellow races. I don't think they give much thought to anything. They argue by assertions proclaimed louder than their opponents. A gramophone has occurred during the last day, and they play the Bing Boys. But how I love them all! It is five o'clock, and the light has just been turned on. R and I have spent the day since 9 a.m. waiting for buses up at the back gate of the White Chateau. Bus after bus, with lorries too, has come up, some with officers and men for the following course, all covered with white dust, but very happy to have got here. Their kits are wheeled off in barrows by their servants into the billets where we have been sleeping for five weeks. We stand about and talk to other officers, go for slow walks out on the E or A road. We talk of ourselves, of our natures and moods, of what we would do if we were home. We tell one another what we were doing before the war, of our friends. R tells me about his wife. We confide our dreams to one another. We talk of the other people in the mess and of the men in our own battalions. It is a sunny day, and against the walls and in sheltered places the heat is pleasant. Out on the E road the whole of F lies before us. A mist is gathering over it from the surrounding hills and from the chimneys of the jute factory. Little girls pass and repass through the crowd of officers with quiet, happy eyes. I am very happy. I love all the men, and simply rejoice to see them going on day by day, their own jolly selves, building up such a wall of jocundity around me. End of section 4「Section five of the Diary of a Dead Officer by Arthur Graham West. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part five. Poems. God, how I hate you, you young, cheerful men. The end of the second year. The night patrol. The owl abashed, or the present estate of Oxford. 
tea in the garden, the last god, spurned by the gods, the traveller, on reading ballads. God, how I hate you, you young, cheerful men. On a university undergraduate moved to verse by the war. Phrases from H. Rex Feston's Quest of Truth, Poems on Doubt, War, Sorrow, Despair, Hope, Death, somewhere in France. He was killed in action and was an undergraduate at Exeter. His attitude is that God is good, amused, rather, at us fighting. Oh, happy to have lived these epic days, he writes of us. This, he had been three years at Oxford, is his address to the atheists. I know that God will never let me die. He is too passionate and intense for that. See how he swings his great suns through the sky. See how he hammers the proud-faced mountains flat. He takes a handful of a million years and flings them at the planet or he throws his red stars at the moon. Then, with hot tears, he stoops to kiss one little earth-born rose. Don't nail God down to rules and think you know, or God, who sorrows all a summer's day because a blade of grass has died, will come and suck this world up in his lips, and lo, will spit it out a pebble, powdered grey, into the whirl of infinity's nothingless foam. This ruined the reputation of all English atheists for months. God, how I hate you, you young, cheerful men, whose pious poetry blossoms on your graves as soon as you are in them, Nurtured up by the salt of your corruption and the tears of mothers, local vicars, college deans, and flanked by prefaces and photographs from all your minor poet friends, the fools, who paint their sentimental elegies where sure no angel treads, and living share the dead's brief immortality. Oh, Christ, to think that one could spread the ductile wax of his fluid youth to Oxford's glowing fires and take her seal so ill. Hark how one chants, oh, happy to have lived these epic days, these epic days. And he'd been to France and seen the trenches, glimpsed the huddled dead in the periscope, hung in the rusting wire, choked by their sickly feet or day and night blown down his throat, stumbled through ruined hearths, proved all that muddy brown monotony where blood's the only coloured thing. Perhaps had seen a man killed, a sentry shot at night, hunched as he fell, his feet on the firing step, his neck against the back slope of the trench, and the rest doubled up between, his head smashed like an eggshell, and the warm grey brain spattered all bloody on the parados had flashed a torch on his face and known his friend shot, breathing hardly, in ten minutes gone. Yet still God's in his heaven. All is right in the best possible of worlds. The woe even his scaled eyes must see is partial. Only a seeming woe we cannot understand. God loves us. God looks down on this our strife and smiles in pity, blows a pipe at times and calls some warriors home, 
We do not die. God would not let us. He is too intense, too passionate. A whole day sorrows he because a grass blade dies. How rare life is. On earth the love and fellowship of men, men sternly banded, banded for what end? Banded to maim and kill their fellow men, for even Huns are men. In heaven above a genial umpire, a good judge of sport, won't let us hurt each other. Let's rejoice God keeps us faithful, pens us still in fold. Ah, what a faith is ours! Almost, it seems, large as a mustard seed. We trust and trust, nothing can shake us. Ah, how good God is to suffer us be born just now, when youth that else would rust can slake his blade in gore, where very God himself does seem to walk the bloody fields of Flanders. He so loves. The End of the Second Year One writes to ask me if I've read of the Jutland battle, of the great advance made by the Russians, chiding, History is being made these days. These are the things that are worth while. These not to one who's lain in heaven before God's throne with eyes abased, worshipping him in many forms of good that sat thereon, turning this patchwork world wholly to glorify him, point his plan towards some supreme perfection, dimly visioned by loving faith. Not these to him when, stressed by some soul-dizzying woe beyond his trust, he lifts his startled face and finds the throne empty, and turns away, too drunk with truth to mind his shame or feel the loss of God. The Night Patrol, France, March 1916 over the top. The wire's thin here, unbarbed, plain rusty coils, not staked and low enough. Full of old tins, though. When you're through, all three, aim quarter left for fifty yards or so. Then straight for that new piece of German wire. See if it's thick and listen for a while for sounds of working. Don't run any risks. About an hour. Now, over and we placed our hands on the topmost sandbags, leapt and stood a second with curved backs, then crept to the wire, wormed ourselves tinkling through, glanced back and dropped. The sodden ground was splashed with shallow pools and tufts of crackling cornstalks two years old no man had reaped and patches of spring grass. Half seen, as rose and sank the flares, were strewn with the wrecks of our attack, the bandoliers, packs, rifles, bayonets, belts and haversacks, shell fragments, and the huge whole forms of shells shot fruitlessly, and everywhere the dead. Only the dead were always present, present as a vile, sickly smell of rottenness. The rustling stubble and the early grass, the slimy pools, the dead men stank through all, pungent and sharp, as bodies loomed before and as we passed, they stank then dulled away to that vague fetor, all-encompassing, infecting earth and air. They lay all clothed, 
each in some new and piteous attitude that we well marked to guide us back, as he outside our wire that lay on his back and crossed his legs crusader-wise. I smiled at that and thought on Elia and his temple church. From him at quarter left lay a small corpse down in a hollow, huddled as in bed, that one of us put his hand on unawares. Next was a bunch of half a dozen men all blown to bits, an archipelago of corrupt fragments, vexing to us three who had no light to see by save the flares. On such a trail so lit for ninety yards we crawled on belly and elbows, till we saw, instead of lumpish dead before our eyes, the stakes and cross-lines of the German wire. We lay in shelter of the last dead man, ourselves as dead, and heard their shovels ring, turning the earth, then talk and cough at times. A sentry fired, and a machine-gun spat. They shot a flare above us, when it fell and spluttered out in the pools of no man's land. We turned and crawled past the remembered dead, past him and him and them and him, until, for he lay some way apart, we caught the scent of the crusader, and slid past his legs and through the wire and home and got our rum. The Owl Abashed, or the Present Estate of Oxford, considered in the Augustan manner. Meanwhile the toga, Tully's phrase forgot, makes way for arms, the muses hover not, as they were wont o'er Oxford's day and night, with calm usurpants and self-conscious right. Athene's owl once held prescriptive roost in every hall and college, and was used with academic hoot to calm abode from eastern Ifley up to Southmoor Road. The great war-eagle, subject of her ban, was weakened to a mild-eyed pelican, pecked his own breast, and dropped a joyful tear when heroes compassed fifteen drills a year. But now the sapient fowl, with staring eyes and loud to woo, upbraids the unlistening skies. To palace shoulder flies she, there to stand, mailed is the shoulder, gauntleted the hand, she drops abashed, and wings along the high, calling her brood with supplicating cry, Come, come, my owlets, as in former days, ye undergraduates and proud be A's. Hear Carfax chime, nine hours of day are sped, why come ye not? Of course, they're all abed. Relieved she sighed, and seemed to hear their snores, to hear scouts hammering at a thousand doors, to know those waking dreams of shadowed pools, punts, girls, eights, waistcoats, proctors, dogs, and schools. She seems to see the breakfast table laid, to scent the coffee and the marmalade, his social song the genial kettle trolls the eggs and bacon warm before the coals. A morning paper, decently inane, lies by the plate to soothe the wakened brain. Blessed by such unobtrusive servile art, the days of comfort comfortably start. And yet I dreamt, the shuddering creature said, my bowers were rifled and my children fled, the heavens disdained me, Pallas' self was cold, yet when Mars ogled her she did not scold. With din of arms rang all the ethereal climb, and tramp of deities a marking time. Yes, twas a nightmare. Ah, P, 
peace-loving men that rise at nine and walk the high at ten to flaunt your socks or buy a straight-grained briar then back to doze with livy by the fire here none need quake where sleep embraces all at shadow armies marching on the wall to fretted minds untuned by life's debate ye are indeed a draught mandragorate thus far the owl then gently bends her flight where streaks of keeble vivify the sight keeble that rose as venus from the main in foamy spumings of a monstrous brain she reached the parks but what a sight was there her swooning weight scarce can her pinions bear these peaceful parks where chattering nursemaids talk where mail carts flock like kensington's broad walk where until now don's babies stumbling ran and consecrated all to peter pan bristle with horrid arms converted thus from field of peace to campus martius she scanned this host of lithe brown feathered fowl for something with a likeness to an owl but there was none she knew them eaglets all of her unmindful heedless of her call in charge of sections or platoons they rant these previous souls before immersed in cant those who taught pompey how to play his cards hope soon to fight their caesar in the guards forlorn she sees the warlike feathers tips in act of sprouting on the upper lips undone she shrieked my nightmare all too true then off she flapped with dismal to woo woo December 1914 Tea in the Garden You see this tea, no milk or sugar in it, like peat-born water's brown translucency, where deep and still it lingers through the shade of hazel curtains. Well, this liquid jewel, this quiet, self-contained smooth rounded pool this glowing agaric gold-threaded dusk tranquilly dreaming yet shot every way by rays of china filtered sunlight steam gliding in banks whirling in eddy dances over the polished floor now leaping off it in restless clouds that win a kiss of the sun ere a death like semeles from the levin brand whisk them to dissolution this brimmed cup let us pretend that it's a human mind that we've created for we poured it out ay and will spill it if we like this mind a young man's mind clean unadulterate and noble too as china tea mines are none of your vulgar one and fourpennies we'll govern as the gods do govern us he's happy now the man wits clean blood warm and dim delightful clouds of sunlit visions like steam are born and die in loveliness continuously but he's not fit to drink needs milk and sugar and we poured him out the best of tea in a biscuit china cup because we meant to drink him milk and sugar will rather stultify his attic salts and cloud the clearness of his intellect but we are gods he is ours and not his own so pass the milk jug and the sugar bowl ah how he lies and sweetly meditates fond fool those fair reflections in his mind 
slow clouds and passing wings, and leaves a flicker like little yellow flames on the poplar tree, and weaves an intricate theology from the silver teapot spout that gave him birth. Your hand and wrist, jewelled and braceleted behind the pot, well-wishing deities that made him out of love, will care for him and bring him home at last. Pour in some milk. His light is dimmed, for quite impermeable is this dull, muddy fluid to the sun. Where are his glinting sparkles, amber glows, the glazed clearness of his mirror-like soul, as sharp reflecting as Narcissus well? His blood runs colder, no more leaping clouds of vaporous spring to gaze on the sun and perish gazing. He's turned practical, his own word that, must keep his energies for the lukewarm days when life is on the lees. Pour in more milk. The cold white heaviness drops clean through all his being. Reascends like monstrous births from wind impregnate wombs in cloudy humours. Like a witch's cauldron, his brain boils up in vaporous melancholy, and pallid phantoms hold in it high revel of tireless, whirling orgy. Sugar him, and a few bubbles of air like noisome gas come popping up and dully burst, a sweet, faint, opiate apathy distills about his goblin-haunted soul. Thick, fatty blobs of yellow cream o'erlay his seething brain and spread a general obscuration, drawing a veil betwixt him and the world of mirrorable beauty, a wrinkled rind like skin on a hag's cheek that shows you still, crinkling and creasing in fantastic flickers, the weary ebb and flow of his sick mind. Come, let us end it. Take that silver spoon and stab him to the soul. The agony of its entrance may confound his fond beliefs concerning us who made him and a flame of purifying hatred cauterize his poisoned being, such a flame as we might wince at, if between our separate worlds were any commerce found. Well struck, he's dead, and only posthumous nervous energy still sends the cream and bubbles floating round, here is no form nor vestige of a mind. Drink him. You take no sugar? No, nor I, of course. Well, pour him on the grass. We two are not gods yet, to torture what we rule and then find joy in the mangled body. Tea. Pour out more tea, and let's pretend no more. THE LAST GOD All gods are dead. Even the great god Pan is dead at length, the lone inhabitant of my ever-dwindling pantheon. Pan, Pan, with what persistency I worship thee! I saw a little crumpled clover-leaf starring the trench-side greenly, or I heard a morning lark and thou wast at my side, smoothing thy child's hair, gainst thy curled flank, pillowing my loving head. When God and Christ abandoned me, thy universal temple was still my home, and I of all thy flock was welcome there. I think that I adored thee as few have ever done. My soul this spring, thrilled with a fuller music to thy touch,
that seemed to me more loving than of old, when most I needed love. Oh, love, 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 love in the ruins, love in toil and war, love in decay of lovers, love in death. I deemed love walked with me, love crowned with life of flower and bird, and laughter of clear streams and the new springing wheat. Now art thou changed to a foul witch. Thou art no Circe now, but Lachesis or Atropos, that whippeth the tortured trees to anguish, killeth joy of bird and leaf and flower. Thy cynic glance sours my old love to hatred. Thy caresses cause me to shudder. All thy colour, song, are crude and heartless. Woo me, woo me now as I wooed thee once. But I think that I, I shall walk on, head high, nor hear thee more. Spurned by the Gods Last night, O oh God, I climbed up to thy house, so loving passionate towards thee, that not the sharp loose flint stones hurt my feet, the blood that the sword grasses and low brambles drew, whipping my ankles, flowed without a smart. The moment lent me wings, and poured divine and glowing ichor pelting through my veins, Chasing the slow cold blood, hot blinding torrents of irised glory beat upon my eyes, and in my throbbing ears there did arise the mighty shouts of gods at festival. There I, thy daughter, thy frail child, half dead from my great love of thee, choking with sobs and panting lungs, my soul rapt to the sphere where choirs the eternal music, my poor body affrighted that these ears should drink the hymns of gods and heroes, lowly on my knees I crouched before thee, and resigned my life to thee, o'erpowered by the trembling ecstasy of deity's completest imminence. I waited hardly breathing, hour on hour through the peering night, wishing that all the strength of thine unshamed myriad-formed desire and manly fervour might delight in me, and like the sacred fire seize me, and so consume me utterly. O oh, sweet renown of Danae and Europa, fierce white bull, would I have asked thee mercy. Mercy! I would have bared my breast to horns and hoofs, and joyed to feel thy hot breath on my face. To have thee gore and trample me, to die a kneaded, quivering mass, thy splendid horns and swinging dewlap dripping hot with blood. Or hadst thou come as erst to Danae, gold in heavy stunning cataracts, red gold beating me down, staining the lilied skin as summer hailstorms ravish the frail vines, stamping them in churned mud, would I have whimpered neath the tremendous lashes of thy love? Nay, as I fainted into happy death, Smothered in the embraces of thy golden arms, A panting reef of gold, Each several piece would seem to lie upon me like a rose. And I should dream I was a child again, Buried in cowslips. This was what I prayed. I offered thee no empty sacrifices. No locks of hair nor entrails of a brute. 
I offered thee myself, my loveliness. I kept it all for thee. I was not timid, not coy before the King of Gods. And thou, thou drab, uxorious tyrant, sat at feast, champing the meat, and craned thy neck, and leered upon me naked on the ground, then beckoned to Juno, and in suasive, wheedling tones murmuring in her ear, pointed to me, thy silly, sentimental votary. And all the gods flocked round, as once they did round Aphrodite, strained in golden mesh to Ares' flanks. Loud laughter shook the sides of all the blessed gods. The blessed gods. And I grew cold and fearful. My dishevelled hair was damp with dew. The fires of adoration flickered, burnt blue, and died in smoky doubt. Thou hadst not come. Once more thou hadst not come. Once more I stumbled through the cold, dead light of windy dawn along the rocky path. No little stone but stabbed now. No sly blade of grass or bramble but deliberately soared through my skin until I cried. I lurked deep in the wild wood, durst not face the eyes of the village folk, but thee I could not fly. Thou took'st a satyr's form, from every shadow glinted thy grinning teeth. I heard thy laugh in the cry of the magpie, mocking thy poor dupe. The burden of intolerable shame that thou hast bound on me, thou wilt not touch to lighten with thy finger. The Traveller Oh, I came singing down the road whereon was naught perplexed me, and Pan with art before me strode, and Walter Pater next me. I garnered my impressions up, lived in each lovely feature. I burned with a hard gem-like flame, and sensitized my nature. We wandered up and down La Beauce, along the castled river, where rarely came the deathly frost to fright us to a shiver. Till at a corner of the way we met with Maid Bellona, who joined us so imperiously that we durst not disown her. My three companions coughed and blushed, and as the time waxed later, one murmured, pulling out his watch, that he must go, twas Pater and very soon art turned away huffed at Bellona's strictures, who hurried us past dome and spire and wouldn't stay for pictures. But old Pan with his satyr legs trotted beside us gamely, till quickening pace and rougher road made him go somewhat lamely. The rents in the La Basse road, the cracks between the cobbling, the wet communication trench, they set poor Pan a-hobbling. He couldn't stand the shells and mud, the saphead or the crater. He used to say the very rats went somehow again later. When we were back behind Bethune in comfortable billets, we too would greet the advancing spring as she sailed up the rillets, and lie neath the fantastic trees to hear the thrushes choiring till young Bellona smelt us out and startled Pan with firing. My heart bled for the kindly God who'd sought so long to serve me, and so I sent him back again. He prayed might heaven preserve me. I went unto the martial maid who laughed to see me lonely. We're rid of them at last, she said. Now I'll be honoured only. And still we fare her road alone, in foul or sunny weather. 
bare is that road of man or god which we run on together seeing her off a whistle mid the distant hills shattered the silence grey she turned on me her great sad eyes then lightly skimmed away i followed slow her flying feet in idlest heaviness but oh my heart it laughed to see roar through the proud express in the after silence and the gloom i found her there again and won three minutes more delight before the second pain on reading ballads in june nineteen fifteen having weekend leave from w camp in surrey i spent the sunday with my sister roaming through the moors and woods round rickmansworth and the chalfonts we had not seen one another for many months and in close conversation forgot all the world except our two selves this experience of intimate aloofness reached its climax when having missed the train at a wayside station a chance which meant my being late in my return to camp we lay down in a field by the track and waiting for the train read ballads to one another the sudden rediscovery of the verse quoted a sixteenth-century anonymous lyric so intense personal and modern in its vivid cry among the long objective ballads startled us both back to the world of pains and desires where we two must leave one another and she return to school and i to camp and the army we lay upon a flowery hill close by the railway lines apollo dusting gold on us between the windy pines we watched the london trains go by full of the weary folk who travelled back that sunday night to six more days of smoke they stared out at the whirling fields and when they saw us two they turned their heads to follow us till we were snatched from view the year was at the summer's spring when grass is fresh and long and flowers are more in bud than bloom and cuckoos slacken song the sane foin and the purple vetch nodding above our lair sighed on the western breeze whose might could barely stir our hair the hawkweed on our ballad book sprinkled its pollen fine and now and then a beetle dropped and wandered through a line sir patrick spens we loitered down tam lynn and young Buchan, and almost felt the sunshine weep for the lass of loch Royan. stanza on stanza endlessly from her lips or from mine benumbed our dreaming souls like drops of a sasean wine i watched her while she read to me as children watch their nurse until my being throbbed to hear this solitary verse o western wind when wilt thou blow that the small rain down can rain christ that my love were in my arms and i in my bed again the little verse cut through the twists of the dream twined spell and robin hood sank back again with the wife of usher's well and an illimitable desire quickened our souls with pain we knew that we were still at one with the people in the train end of part five and end of the diary of a dead officer by arthur graham west Recorded by Ruth Golding for Remembrance Sunday, 2010.